Welcome to the Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals, August 9th, 2017 meeting. Uh, we have a roll call. If, if you're okay with that, would you uh, be comfortable with that, sir? Sure. Karen's uh, not in today. She's on vacation. Sure. Ms. Shu? Here. Uh, Mr. Blaze? Here. Mr. Hebert? Here. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Loisel? Present. Mr. Crockett? Here. And with us, we have Ms. Saucier as attorney for the town. Um, Okay, first uh, duty is let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. A uh, couple of uh, housekeeping duties. I'd like to have the board allow us to move number 2609, if both parties are here. Uh, which is a practical difficulty variance request by Stephen Lynch, 14 Pearl Street, such as map U2, parcel 84, to the first position, as uh, we have the attorney here for tonight uh, to deal with that issue. Do we have all parties here? They're out in the hall, sorry. No. Okay, we we'll can take you. a second. Well, we need to approve the minutes anyway. Yeah, so why don't I have a motion on the minutes? Any discussion on the minutes? <coughs> <coughs> motion approve this presented. You have a second? Second. second. Discussion on the minutes. Seeing none, all in favor? And I abstain. Abstaining? Okay, thank you very much. And we'll give them just a second. I'll make sure they're okay. I don't want to push you guys. <coughs> if, uh, it's going to cause, cause undue stress, but I thought it might be a little easier. And I, and I apologize to the other two applicants, but uh, <coughs> we're trying to work, watch town taxes. So. Are you okay with us moving yeah. those around? Okay. So, and both parties are okay with that? Starting, moving that up? All right. Thank you. Okay. Now, I need a vote to be able to allow us to do that. So, I have a motion that we can move that to the first agenda item. Motion to move item 2609 to first on the agenda. Second. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Okay. That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. A uh, little bit of research. Uh, Update on this. This is a file that we originally did in September of 2016. It's come back to us uh, after going to uh, Superior Court and had some issues that needed to be addressed, and so it's been remitted back to us. Mr. Saucier and Mr. Um, Longfellow, I'll let you two discuss what is taking place and what we are trying to accomplish sure. today. Yeah, I'll give you a brief overview of where we are on this, on this matter today. Thank you. So, as the Chair mentioned, this um, was approved for a variance back in September of last year. That was appealed to the Superior Court. The parties briefed the case, but the, just, the justice did not reach the issues. The justice sent it back down. She remanded it to this board for additional findings. And I, I wrote a very brief memo which summarized the case and provided the case. But in essence, the, the court has asked you to do three things from my reading of it, and of course you can hear from the parties as well. The first thing is to make a findings on the definition of practical difficulty. You may remember on for practical difficulty variance, it says there you have to meet the definition of practical difficulty plus meet the, the seven criteria that are listed within that ordinance. In your original decision, you just had findings on those seven criteria and not the definition of practical difficulty. Let me read that to you. A practical difficulty is a case where strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone which is located and also which would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. So that's what the court's asking you to make a finding on. Second, the court, um, in a footnote, uh, raised the petitioner, the, the, uh, the appellant, raised an argument in the appeal about whether there's a 38-foot building depth limit to buildings in this in this district, particularly for this type of building. That's under the Higgins Beach Code. There was some discussion, as the as the justice wrote in the um, uh, in the opinion in the, in the minutes, but there was not a finding on whether that was allowed. The, the, the depth as pro as proposed was allowed under the ordinance or not. So you should discuss that issue and make a finding on that. And finally, third, um, at the very end of the opinion, the justice noted court noted that you should determine whether uh, make findings on quote each variance that was sought 
So you had a general project that you created variances for. So one thing you should do is clarify whether your findings were for each of the variances or each of the areas of relief the applicant was asking for, or if you needed to make additional findings for uh, particular particular parts of the project. So that's just a decision I think you need to make. <coughs> that's, those are the three takeaways I, I held from the course. So those are your, that's your job tonight is to, in particular, make a finding on the practical difficulty variance, clarify the 38-foot building depth, and also clarify whether your findings were for all of the, all of the quote, variances. Uh, and if not, then make additional findings. Um, my recommendation is that you allow, obviously, you hear from the applicant and the abutter and any other person in the party who wishes to speak on those issues. Um, you do not have to open it up to all the other standards, the seven criteria you already made uh, findings on. You can readopt those, in my opinion, if you'd like to. It's in your discretion if you'd like to hear more or make additional findings on this. So I think that's where we are today. Um, and, then, um, and then at the end, you make a decision whether the variance should be granted or not. The court actually uh, vacated your, the variance. So you see, if, to the extent, you, if, it's a, if you find in the positive on the practical difficulty, you would grant it again. If not, you would deny it. So that's, that's where we are tonight. Thank you. Here to answer any questions as you go through the process as well. Great. Is there a particular sequence that we should be addressing these? I, I would just recommend taking them in order. It doesn't matter really, but I think you know if you're going to go through just the way that the opinion is written, I think you would make this, make uh, findings on the practical difficulty definition first, make a decision on the 38 foot length -ish next, and then clarify or add to your findings as it relates to it. Was that for all of the additions, or was there something else you need to be specific about? And then, of course, I'd hear from the applicant first, the abutter, and then anyone in the audience, and then then commence your del deliberations. What I'd like to do first of all is four of the members that were here in September are still at the board, and Shu, myself, and I'd like to take a second with the two other members of the board uh, to discuss whether or not you've had a chance to read the information, whether you feel comfortable in participating in this piece of the section, if you've done. Uh, a good handle on what's going on with this meeting and the history of the event. So why don't I start with you? So I have, I have read through all the information that was provided and uh, I, feel, um, I feel educated on this enough to contribute to the discussion tonight. I've also reviewed the case and understand it. Does the board have any problem with either of these two actively participating? No. Seeing none, we okay with this? Okay. Well, why don't we start off with dealing with the first question, which is the practical difficulty, uh, the definition of practical difficulty. And if we, we can start, we'd like to start with uh, the, the applicants presenting their situation and that issue, so feel free. Take the microphone, state your name and address, and we'll go from there. My name is Jim Katsafikas. I'm counsel for Mr. Lynch. Could you explain your first, sir? K-A-T-S-I-A-F-I-C-A-S. Thank you. It's certainly not the first time I've been asked to spell that. <laughs> <laughs> and with, I'm with the law firm of Perkins Thompson in Portland and representing Mr. Lynch in this matter. Uh, we agree that there's a very limited scope of what's before the board this evening. It's the findings on the practical difficulty, uh, decision with regard to building depth, does it or does it not comply. The seven variance criteria have been found. You'll simply have to readopt them because the court has vacated your decision. And then the board will ultimately have to make a finding to grant the variance. One question that came up, though, is what exactly does the board have to do tonight? Because the court said the board should make findings with regard to all proposed additions. What does that mean? I, I, you know, you could, it could be that all of the findings that support granting a variance apply to all of the additions. So you just you have one set of findings that, that governs everything. It's simply you should say that if that's what you're going to do. You know, does the same circumstances support all of the variance requests, the, the three additions that are a part of this building? And, and that would be some, one way to address it if you find that that's correct. But before we go into the weeds on that, let's, if we can talk about practical difficulty and what it means for a minute. Uh, you've got some other ordinance, uh, some other variance applications <coughs> before you tonight and several of them are under the undue hardship test, which is a very stringent test, as you know. It's very difficult to get an undue hardship test uh, variance in Maine law. And 
in the early 90s, there were a lot of takings uh, claims being brought against municipalities that their ordinances were too restrictive, their zoning ordinances took all the value of the property, and people were suing municipalities claiming that there was a regulatory taking. Uh, I suggested to the Maine Real Estate Developers Association that uh, one way that we could avoid having all these takings claims would be if people could actually get a variance and suggested that we could have a less stringent test for a variance. And I offered the law, as it was in New York, the, the pre-1992 dimensional variance standards from New York as an example. So that was, I provided it to Merida, their lobbyists ran with it, and in 1997, the Maine legislature adopted the practical difficulty test. It is intended to be less stringent than the undue hardship test. As Mr. Saucier explained to you, what it means under practical difficulty is that the strict application of the ordinance to the property, one, precludes the ability of the petitioner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located, and two, results in ec significant economic injury to the petitioner. Many municipalities in Maine have adopted home rule ordinances to incorporate this practical difficulty test. Portland, South Portland, and Scarborough have done so, and many other Maine municipalities. However, because it's still relatively new, there isn't a lot of case law telling us when a practical difficulty occurs. Uh, we have the Roe versus City of Port South Portland case where the, the state Supreme Court noted how difficult it was to give an undue hardship variance, denied, uh, reversed the, uh, the decision of, uh, with regard to the undue hardship that had been granted there, and then said, you know, there's always a practical difficulty test that you folks could adopt. They did, and that went on. In O'Toole versus the City of, of Portland, there was a question about a practical difficulty variance, but it was about two of the criteria, two of the seven criteria not about whether there was a practical difficulty. <coughs> the real guidance we have is a Superior Court decision involving South Portland, Wiper versus the City of South Portland. It's a 2005 Superior Court order. Justice Warren decided that case, and, and what had happened is a variance had been granted. The board did not make a decision as to whether what the findings were for a practical difficulty. The board probably felt, well, we're granting a practical difficulty variance. We found the seven criteria. There must be a practical difficulty. Justice Warren said, I don't, I, I'm not going to make findings on my own based what's, on what's there. I'm going to send it back, just as Justice Mills did here, for a determination of findings by the board. But he suggested in that decision what he might look to. He said, well, I could find, but I'm not going to because I'm not the board, that it might be the inadequacy of the existing residential structure, which was conceded by the parties, which could be that the existing structure didn't comply with setback requirements, that there was an inability to expand because it would go into areas that were prohibited because it was used by the septic, that they'd have to connect to the city sewer, there would be enormous expense. These were some of the things he said, you know, maybe I could make a finding on this, but you didn't make a finding, I'm sending it back to you. So that's what the court has looked to in one other situation when the question was, is there a practical difficulty? So this, work, this matters before this board tonight because of a variance that was granted, and we, you have to determine whether there's a practical difficulty and what those findings are. The entire building is located almost entirely within the setback, within the 30-foot rear setback. It's about three feet from the rear property line. Uh, the variance has been applied for in order to update a building that has problems. It is not something that you would build today if you were seeking to build the codes. And that creates some real limitations in its use. And you'll hear from Mr. Lynch about that. We'd note, though, in this, this Higgins Beach zone, permitted uses include single family attached dwellings, accessory uses, municipal buildings and uses. And as to the existing dwelling, we know there's, it's non conforming as to the front and rear setbacks. And there's a reason for it that Mr. Lynch will tell you about. We know that the building is almost entirely within the 30-foot rear setback. There was evidence that was introduced at the first hearing that the ceiling is low in the kitchen, that one wall in particular on the out, on, uh, of the uh, kitchen leads to a very low ceiling that, that's difficult to use. There are windows upstairs that don't provide sufficient egress. The interior stairway is both too narrow, about two feet wide, and too steep. And these interfere with common uses of that existing dwelling and, and diminish its value. 
these issues, these problems, would be addressed by the expansion. That's already in the record, and you could look to that for your findings. But Mr. Lynch has some additional information. Since he'd like to do this piece by piece, I'd ask, if I may, if Mr. Lynch could just tell you some of the information with regard to the practical difficulty part of it. And Mr. Wilson, the architect, I believe, has a bit to add as well. So if I could turn that over to them, please. Sure, that's fine. Thank you. Yes, good evening. Robert Stephen Lynch, the owner of 14 Pearl Street, and thank you for your time this evening. Um, I submitted in this, for the second meeting before you a couple of three documents that I want to very briefly explain. The first one is a, a photograph of my house. I think you have it in your package. Um, this is actually a photograph from about 1880. Those are my ancestors <laughs> sitting on the porch all dressed up at the beach, but that's what they did in those days. Um, this is my house as it is today in the exact configuration on the two sides you can see. Actually, if you saw the back of this house in 1880, it was substantially larger than it is today. But this is my house in its configuration and where it is today. And that's important because in the original days of Higgins Beach, you can see people, people owned their houses, but they didn't own the land. It was owned by Hiram Higgins, the owner of Higgins Farm. The second document I gave you was um, this plot of where, for the first time, uh, when Hiram Higgins decided to sell the property at Higgins Beach, they broke it up into many 50 by 100 lots, and they superimposed that, unfortunately, <laughs> onto my house. Uh, the house was there before the lot lines and before Pearl Street. This is 1897. You can see it on the document. So for no fault of my own, somehow, back then, those, that line was drawn within one to three feet of my rear line, and Pearl Street was built how many feet from the other line? So I didn't cause that. Um, that's the history of it. And you see finally the third document, um, 1901, when my ancestors, Dr. Martin, actually acquired that lot, I think it's number 66 here. So that's why it is so non-conforming now. Um, so as a result of this, um, and the result of the, the way the house was built, and it was completely built by 1880, um, there's several uses of this home, which would normally, which are permitted for a home in this zone, which uh, I am not allowed to do because of these circumstances. Number one is renting my house for a few weeks in the summer. Um, um, and, 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 as Mr. Fury does. And I want to be clear. Um, Mr. Fury is an absentee landlord. So I, I, I would prefer to keep just the facts of this as opposed to any conversations about Okay. It'll go both ways. Okay, fair enough. Because of the danger of the stairway, and, of our, and I had a tenant actually fall once, um, I, the liability I've been advised is, is too high to rent it without fixing these defects. Um, number two, um, I am self-employed. I'm an advisor to the municipalities throughout the state of Maine, Northeast, in areas of solid waste and recycling. Um, I moved to this, uh, to Maine, to Higgins Beach, as a full-time resident about two years ago. Previously, I always had a home office. When I looked into get, getting a home office for my home here, which is allowed in this zone, you have to ask for permission to do it, but my business is a very zero impact business. I, all of my meetings are outside the home. I don't have meetings in my home. People don't come. Um, but I would, it would nevertheless require general liability insurance on my home office, which to date I haven't been able to get because of the condition of the home. Um, so there's a use that I can't have. Um, another use 
normal repair and maintenance of windows and doors. The side of the building that's very low, I can't buy a, go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy a standard door, replacement screen door or storm door because it's too low. I have to have a custom built uh, windows and doors for that wall, which is very expensive. So these are both, these are some, there's others, but these are the ones I thought I'd talk about tonight. Uses that are allowed in the zone that I'm prohibited from because of strict application of the setbacks um, and also have significant economic injury to me. Now, um, talking about the depth of the building, although there were not findings, Phil, at the first ZBA board meeting, um, I think that's because Brian, in his uh, comments on the record uh, from that first meeting, said that's not the problem. The, the depth of the building is fine. Everything's fine. The problem is this building being so close to the back. But we we all, I, I think Brian, Brian said that. It's in the record, and I think everybody yeah. felt that was a problem. For a second. I, I don't like you putting any words into his mouth. If he wants to agree to that, that's fine. But is that consistent with what you believe, or is that... Hmm. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. We're not talking about building depth at this moment. Anything. Right. So, so that, I just want to say that's why, it, if Brian has said no, it's a big problem, we need another variance, but that's not what he said. Okay. Um, another thing I want to mention, and it's the final thing. <laughs> um, I have four abutters, you know, Mr. Fury in, on, on the other street. Um, visually, there would be zero impact to him of my proposal. The three abutters that are next door to me, and two abutters on each side and one across Pearl Street, they're the ones that will see and hear and experience this expansion. They are all, they've all submitted letters of support. In fact, Allison Eckert, uh, the, a non-family one, one of them is my sister, so you expect, you know, she was supportive, but Allison Eckert said Steve's set, appeared and made testimony here, saying this would be great, we're very happy, this is a modest improvement, he could have gone for a lot more in the permitted building envelope. We like Steve, he's been a great neighbor for many, many, many years. So thank you for hearing me out, and now I'm gonna ask Walter to address a couple, uh, the last few issues <coughs> before us tonight. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Walter Wilson from Design Company. Yeah. I'm the one who's been drawing the plans on this project. Um, there were two things I was asked to speak about, one being the square footage of the house versus the proposed house. Uh, the existing house with first and second floor has 1,375 square feet. The proposed house with the first and second floor is 2,154 has an increase of about 780 square feet, which represents about 56.7% increase in the total square footage. So it's not a huge, massive doubling of size of building. The other thing I was asked to talk about is the overall depth of the building on the lot, which uh, Steve indicated was discussed at the first meeting. It was discussed, but it wasn't, didn't have any dimensions actually put to it. Okay, uh, the lot's 100 feet deep. In the uh, Higgins Beach zone, the front of the main structure has to be at least 18 feet from the street. And the rear yard setback is 30 feet, total of 48. So on the main building envelope, you have 50 foot, 52 feet in depth. Now there is a restriction in the ordinance for the main principal mass of the house cannot exceed 38 feet in depth. But then you're allowed to put a rear addition onto that that goes up to the rear setback line. So the, the main mass of the building at 38, then you can put a 14-foot um, addition on the rear of that, and the total building can be 52 feet in depth. Now also to that part of the ordinance, you also have to put a porch on the front of the house within that 18-foot setback to the main mass building. And that porch can be up to 10 feet by code. So the overall mass of the building could be from front to back 62 feet in depth. 
Now, that's not counting put and bump outside additions, rear porches, interval porches, and all the other components allowed in the code. That's the main building itself. Uh, so the principal building plus the rear additions, 52 feet in depth, and up to a 10-foot porch put in the front. And the porch in the front is not just a little stoop. It has to be come out with a porch, has to have a roof on it, has to be at least 50% the width of the front of the house. So it's a substantial porch. Um, the building that uh, I gotta grab my prints. Can you just sure? No problem. <clears throat> okay, the main building as it stands right now exists from the front of the house. To the rear of the house is 31 foot 6 inches. Um, to that, the, plan, the plans call for a 15 and a half foot expansion towards the front, which will get the overall depth of the building uh, approximately um, 47 feet in depth, which is less than the 52 allowed in the ordinance. So the new building proposed is less than what any building is allowed to be on a 100-foot deep lot. Um, with that said, the <coughs> expansion we're talking about is in the front of the house, not in the back of the house, not abutting the rear part of the property line. No changes are to take place in the back shape of that house at all other than uh, putting new windows and sidings and new roof and trim on the house. The house stays the same. The Majority of the changes are in the front of the house, and with the approval we got last time, we had a small extension of two feet on the side of the house, and that was to correct that low headroom problem in the kitchen where the outside wall's five and a half feet high. And uh, that was needed to done, be done to correct that height limit. Um, theoretically, it could have gone farther and asked for more on the setback but I didn't because that's all we needed for it, and I didn't want to include any more than what was needed to fix that, that situation. Those were the two basic things that we looked at in the setback. Building in the front and that little side, two-foot addition in the side, which only affected about 15, 16 feet on the length of the building. There was no encroachment on the rear yard, no encroachment from the existing building closer to the property line. It maintained the status quo of where it is now. Now, a couple other things we did talk about at that meeting, and just to refresh your memory, was about relocating the building and picking up and moving it, and uh, the inability more than likely to move that building because of the way it's built, and it had been tried to uh, picked up and put a new foundation on it before, and they had problems with it because when it was picked up for the new foundation for a few inches, even then some of the joints and stuff of the add-on started falling apart. And in going through the building and looking at it and investigating the basement, I can see that you can't pick this house up and move it. Uh, if it did, it's going to be destroyed. Uh, it can be improved where it is, which is what we're, we're proposing to do. Also, <coughs> um, Steve reiterated about the problem with the stairwell. Well, as we stated at the first meeting at the zoning board, this house has a center core of an old carriage house that was brought in and everything built around it. It has the old-fashioned little partially curved ceiling still available from the old wagon. You can't relocate that stairway within that structure and put a new stairway in meeting today's code without destroying some other living part of the room or destroying a room that's attached to it as far as space goes because everything is so small. And you can't put that stairway in the middle of the house where the old carriage is because that would completely destroy the structure of the carriage with which the house is actually built around and over. The stairway you'd have to put in to meet code would be significantly larger than it is now. That's why on the plans, I relocated the stairway to the front part where the addition is so we can put a code compliant, compliant stairway in that front addition and then I worked out the circulation pattern for upstairs so it wouldn't interfere with the bedroom sizes upstairs any more than possible. But relocating that stairway within the existing structure is basically impossible to do unless you really have to
take everything apart and destroy it to do it. That's not the objective of what the owner would like. He'd like to maintain that old, old camp look on the inside of the house. And even if he did relocate the building like I reiterated to, the cost of doing that is significant. You have to pick up the house, move it, store it, take out the foundation, fill in the hole, structurally compact it, put in a new foundation, all new utilities, and bring the building back again. It would probably be more than what the value of the structure is worth to do that. And that's easy to understand. You don't need any dollars and cents for that. Um, and like I said, uh, in order to renovate that existing building to code in its current state <coughs> would not only be extremely difficult, it might be impossible when it comes to wall heights, window egress sizes, size of doors, stairways, uh, and all that kind of stuff to put into that to rehab that building. You'd almost have to rip it all apart to do it. Um, the proposal is that the main part of the structures were put in the front of the house, new kitchen, stairway, new living space, and that was the reason for the um, zoning board application before, which you approved, and uh, the existing building was to remain as is except for decorative problems, fix-up, fix maintenance, and patch-up stuff. Um, like I said, there's no encroachment on Mr. Furry's property at all. Um, and like I said, adding a proper stairway within the building, which seems to be the key point of this renovation project, you have to move it outside the building to get a legal stairway, outside the confines of the existing building to get a stairway in there that's going to work. Um, and that's what we proposed, and that's what the board approved, and we are still under the same dimensional standards and stuff that we were approved at last time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open up the uh, public for uh, the... Uh, any more questions from the board? Oh, yeah. Do any questions from the board first? I do it. I have one letter that was sent to us uh, from uh, Thompson and Colin Bass. Uh, any other letters or phone calls? No, just the, the previous ones from... The Last previous one, and I probably ought to read this in. This is from Kelly. Uh, that's yeah. That's for the, that's uh, yeah. That's part of the thing. There was one other letter. That I marked it. No, over on that file. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so there's two documents that we have. I'll read the, the first one in is tied uh, directly to the comments uh, that Mr. Um, Wilson said regarding the, the moving of the structure. This is from, uh, I think it's Kyle Will, uh, Warren or Kayla Warren. I've heard it both ways. But uh, for those who don't know, he's actually relatively well known as far as a, a builder in this area. Um, Hello, Mr. Uh, Hello, Attorney McCall. I have conducted a drive-by look into the probability of successful lift on-site move of the structure. In addition to logistical considerations, I always have two primary concerns related to the structure itself. The first being the existing structural integrity of the building. I do not see anything on my drive-by to suggest that the current structural integrity of the building is compromised to a point that it would adversely affect the effort. With today's machinery and technology, only buildings that have been neglected and allowed to fall into extreme state of disrepair re represent a significant challenge for a building mover. I would be concerned if the building had excessive rot or had been burned in a fire and not properly restored. I have not heard of the, that these conditions exist. If they do, I would recommend a thorough repair prior to the lift and move. Regarding the second concern, I look for excessively large windows, door openings, that may have been done either without proper designation or, I'm sorry, design or construction. This is important because of the stress put on such openings. I did not see anything that concerned me relating to that issue. In summary, I'm confident from a drive-by perspective that the building would withstand a lift and on-site move with no more disruption than what would normally be expected. The one area I am not as certain of is the small jog on the side of the building. I simply could not see enough of it on the drive-by to render my opinion. I could move, it could move well or it may need extra attention. My construction experience was vast and nationally recognized. I have been an on-air national home improvement expert for CBS, 
I took over the position originally held by the Venerable Bob Vila. I am an accomplished home improvement author with Doubleday Publishing. I have a, I've had a recurring guest appearances on home, uh, HDTV and more. As a developer and construction professional, I've had several projects that involve the need to lift and move structures. In fact, I'm currently working on an upcoming project that requires just that. Throughout my career, I've had to lift and move both residential and commercial structures. The structures range in age from 20 to 120 years old. To date, I have not had a failed lift outside move pro uh, on site move project. Please advise if you would like any additional information at his best. And then the other letter is from uh, Lisa J uh, Jasmine. Jasmine. Um, and she is at. She is not at. Oh yeah, 23 Pearl Street. I would like to offer my wholehearted support for the various application being considered for the property at 14 Pearl Street. This is a very historic property dating back to when most roads went parallel to the water line and not perpendicular to the water. Maintaining as much of the look and feel of the original structure while letting the owner update the property to current uh, architectural standards would offer the best solution for the owner and for the neighborhood. We urge you to support uh, to vote in favor of Mr. Lynch's request, sincerely. Those are the two letters. I don't think we had any other phone calls or any other letters. Okay. Um, anything you'd like to add at this point? Uh, no, I think you won't want to open it up. Okay. Why don't we open it up to the public to speak? I know we have the, uh, the next door neighbor. Feel free to come up. <coughs> Good, e <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Mark Fury. My principal residence is 21 Sheffield Street in Portland, Maine, but I own the cottage located at 13 Ocean Avenue in Higgins Beach. My cottage, uh, my rear uh, property line is Mr. Lynch's rear property line. Mr. Lynch's cottage is built right on that line. It's not three feet back. Some, in some places, it's right on the line. In some places, it might be a foot back. In two places, namely his propane tank and the entrance to his cellar, it is over the line onto my property. On a typical day, if I'm in my backyard or on my back deck and there is conversation in the Lynch cottage, I can hear every word they say. This tells me that if I'm speaking, on my deck or in my backyard or in my house in the summertime with all the windows open, they can hear every word I say. I'm opposing this project because by and large it is not a correction of an older cottage, it is an expansion of that older cottage and when you add on the porch in addition to the 17 by 26 foot expansion, it is what it means for me, this variance will last forever. What this means for me is something on the order of two-thirds more noise, uh, two-thirds more occupants, two-thirds more conversation, stereo music, barking dogs, or whatever. It infringes on my privacy and uh, my peace and quiet. Mr. Lynch acquired this property in 1998. Shortly after that, he put it into the air. When he bought it, it had no foundation. He took out the wooden posts. He could have put that cottage anywhere he wanted to put it, but he put it right back down where it is now, right on the property line. He didn't move it. He knew then he was in violation of setback. He didn't move it. Now he wants to enlarge it, which is just going to make the problem worse. The first issue is loss of use. My parents purchased that property in the 1960s. The Lynches were occupying it then as a single family residence. We are now over 50 years later. It has been occupied continuously as a single family residence. There is no loss of use. And I've uh, presented the tax card to the board. There is no loss of value. It's a very valuable property. And most of the value is in the land, not in the building. I don't understand why we need a 17 foot by 26 foot addition and a 7 foot uh, by 14 foot porch to
to correct some problems in the old cottage. You don't need to do that to correct the windows or you could, you could even fit the uh, staircase in there. You could make that cottage more serviceable if uh, that's what they were interested in. My principal objection is I don't think, I think the zoning ordinance should work for me as well as Mr. Lynch as well as anybody else. And I'm entitled to uh, peace and quiet uh, I'm entitled to some privacy in my backyard. The major problem they're having is the maximum front setback. The maximum front setback is designed to bring development closer to the street so that people like me can have some privacy in their backyard. So this goes directly against that. Uh, I've set out that, what I've just said, and some other things in my letter to the board, and I, and I hope you will consider what is in that letter. Some of the more technical arguments I'm going to leave to my attorney, uh, Ed McCall, who also submitted a letter, and he'll talk about some of these issues, and in particular, the building depth issue. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you again. Uh, members of the board, my name is Ed McCall. I live just across the Spurwink River in, the, uh, in Cape Elizabeth. Um, so it's a pretty good nine iron to be uh, uh, on the federal property on the Scarborough side of the river. Um, I'm here on behalf of, of Mr. Fury and uh, opposing uh, this variance. I'd like to first talk about some of the legal issues to clarify how I see the, the remand from the Superior Court. I think what the judge has said is for each of the two variances that were uh, initially granted, the, bo the board needs to find that there's a practical difficulty, which is, a, uh, I think, a much more difficult test than, than Attorney Cassie Afikas has suggested, and each of the seven factors for each of those two variances. And then the, then the board needs to address whether you need a third variance because, and I'll talk about this in a second, but clearly there's a limit in this zone for this type of house of, of a 38-foot limit. You can get a back addition that would lengthen that, but expressly in that statute, back additions can't be in the rear setback. So the point of that, from our perspective, is exactly this circumstance. The total mass of that house can only be 38 feet deep, you can go longer as long as, as, as long as you're not in the rear setback, but if you're in the rear setback, you're limited to the 38 feet. Then you have to address the, 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 the very difficult standard for getting a variance. So since there's expressly in your uh, Article 4-14, and I mistyped the section in my letter, a limit to 38 feet for this house, the fact that some other house that doesn't encroach on setbacks in the same size lot could go to 52 feet doesn't mean this house can go to 52 feet and be in the rear setback. It's written exactly the way it's written as a 38-foot limit. So turning to the, to the uh, two proposed variances, the, the first one is a relatively small variance in the rear setback. There weren't any findings that there was a loss of use unless you've got a variance for that addition in the rear, and it doesn't really make any sense. The bigger addition is in, is in the main part of the house going forward, and frankly, there isn't a proper showing or, even, or really any evidence of a loss of use if you don't get that addition either. Here's what loss of use means, that there's an approved use in this zone that you can't have without a variance. Now, as Mr. Fury just said, Mr. Lynch and his family have lived in that house a long time without a variance. They put a foundation under it right where it is, making it permanent, um, uh, and di didn't enlarge the house or move it forward. You certainly can have a single family house in the Lynch home. They have for a long time. Mr. Lynch has, has argued in his written submission here and in the court that there's faulty wiring, which is a problem. That does not require a substantial addition to the house to fix. That, that there should be larger egress windows upstairs, but his plans that they've submitted plainly show, and I explained this in my letter, those larger windows are all going in walls that aren't being changed. They're not part of the addition. So you can solve the upstairs window problem 
without a variance. Uh, he also says the ceiling is low in that wing, which is on the, from the street, the right side of his house. The ceiling gets low because the, because the roof slopes down. You would get a higher ceiling if you shortened the building, not expanded it. The reason the ceiling is going up is because he's reconfiguring the roof. And also in his calculations, he's got a shed attached to the house now, which he's converting into interior living space. And that all happens in the rear setback. Um, so he's taking a shed, making it a house, making the, making the roof taller to, ad to address those issues. But none of those issues is the loss of a use. It may, be, it may be that the house is older and more charming than he would now like. He'd like it to stay charming and be bigger. But having a bigger house isn't a loss of a use. A use isn't, isn't a bigger house. Everybody would always like a bigger house. A use would be that you can't live there or you really can't uh, have a home office there, which is a permitted use. But uh, Mr. Lynch's argument, as I understand it, that he can't have a home office is he can't, he, he, he says without any evidence that it's, in, in his written submission from his lawyer is, general liability insurance would be more expensive. He says he can't get it, but there isn't any evidence that he can't get it. And with all due respect to Mr. Lynch, and I met him and, I, and seems like a nice guy, you can, get in, you can get general comprehensive liability insurance to run your uh, business out of your home uh, with the issues in the house. But more than that, all of the issues with the house can be fixed without the variance. Uh, Mr. Wilson's explanation tonight that as to, as to the difficulty in fixing it was you would have to use up other space to make the stairs bigger and maybe you would have to substantially change the charming nature of the house that isn't, and the way he, this is the way he put it, isn't what Mr. Lynch wants to do. And I, and I respect that Mr. Lynch should get to do what he wants to do on his property, but what he wants to do requires a variance, and you don't get a variance. You haven't lost a use if the house isn't going to look quite the way you want or have quite the feel that you want unless you get a variance. That's not loss of a use. The standard can't be met. Fortunately for Mr. Lynch, if he wants to preserve the core part of that house, he plainly can pull it forward on the lot and have a big addition. He can, he can have the charming house, he can have the charming house with an addition, or if he wanted to, he could t take the house down, which is generally what I rented at Higgins Beach when I got divorced, <laughs> and it was when all the houses were coming down and, and really big houses were going up in their place. And, um, and he could do that. And Mr. Fury isn't saying that Mr. Lynch has to do any one of those three things. But he has three clear options that don't require a variance and that don't uh, affect a use, his ability to rent, his ability to have his home office, his ability to have better wiring, the bigger windows he proposes, the better ceiling, the better <coughs> stairs. He can renovate that house right where it sits without changing the outside walls, put in the bigger windows, put in the, put in the better stair. He can pull it forward on the lot. Uh, and do all of those things and make it bigger, or he could tear it down as many people have done at Higgins Beach and build a much bigger building inside the building envelope. And I watched the tape of the last hearing. I wasn't here at the time, but um, I so, shared... So can I, excuse me, Mr. Wilson, could you please... Uh, thank you. I, I share, as some members of the board did, the, the respect for wanting to preserve... Uh, and existing cottage and existing cottage feel, as much as I applaud that point of view and share it personally, it's not a consideration in your zoning ordinance that constitutes loss of a use or, or significant economic injury. You have uh, a zoning ordinance that protects historic structures and gives some breaks from zoning for designated historic structures. This house isn't on that list. So Mr. Lynch hasn't, and, and there's some burdens that come with that. Mr. Lynch hasn't asked to have the benefit or the burdens of being on that list. So preserving his feel of his house, although understandable, isn't a proper basis uh, for what he's requesting. Uh, the, there is, it's clear to me there's a 38-foot limit on that house 
in your section 4-14. He can't have a rear addition and have it be in the setback. So the fact that somebody else on a different lot with a different house could have 52 feet in that zone doesn't change the way your ordinance is written, that the limit is 38 feet. He needs to get a variance to go uh, past 38 feet. He wants to go to 47 or 48 feet, depending on what you read. And that would require him to show that without going beyond 38 feet, he would lose a use, that some permitted use would be impossible on that property, and he would suffer substantial economic injury. And with due respect to Mr. Lynch and, and Attorney Katsafik, as far as any lawyer in town, you can't even argue with a straight face that being limited to the standard length house in that region loses a cause costs you a use and results in substantial economic injury. The argument really just can't be made. So for those reasons, we submit that Mr. That Mr. Lynch, fortunately for him, has three options and he ought to pick those options. Renovate the house exactly without expanding it, uh, pull the house forward, or uh, build a bigger house if he wants a bigger house in his building envelope. And those are all options readily available to him. They solve all of his problems. Uh, and they protect Mr. Fury's right to have peace and quiet and a backyard that doesn't end at his next door neighbor's house. Under grandfathered, uh, under the nature of existing structures, when you buy a house and your neighbor's house is right up against your property line, you're stuck with that. But when your neighbor wants to substantially expand his house, he then has an obligation to address the burden that he's putting on your property by the fact that his house is right on the line. It, it, under the law, it doesn't, in my mind, make a big difference that Mr. Lynch had the opportunity a decade or so ago to pull that house forward and instead plopped it right back down on the property line. But that's what happened. So the house is where it is on a foundation because Mr. Lynch picked it up, poured a foundation, and put it straight back down right where it is um, and made that circumstance permanent. And made it permanent because he presumably was satisfied with the size and shape of the house he had on the foundation he poured a decade ago. Thank you very much. We'd be pleased to answer any questions that, uh, that the board has. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind staying near to the microphone, that might be the case. Okay. Thank and same thing if you'd like to, Mr. Fury, if you'd like to be a little bit closer in case somebody has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. So just going to give the, the board and some support here from either of uh, long staff or uh, let's talk about what our, our mission here is. We basically want to clarify whether or not we believe that from the previous meeting and the information today, we meet the standard of a uh, hardship. I just, just one quick procedural issue. Make sure, I, I would make sure that there was no one else in the public that wishes to speak. Oh, thank you. Um, and also, uh, yeah, and, I, and you have discretion of the ordinance to re allow a rebuttal. Thanks. from the other side, and I believe uh, Attorney Getzevich has reserved the 38-foot issue to, to address. It has been, it will, uh, you're right, so let's, it will allow both traffic to go. I'd rather have all the information out and make sure everybody's comfortable with what they've said and, and on the record. So, uh, again, what we're trying to do is establish that if you'd like to speak and discuss anything, feel free. And they may also want to come back, but feel free. <coughs> With regard to, to picking up the house and moving it, uh, we, you know, the letter was re uh, received today with regard to a, to a drive-by analysis of whether it's possible. Uh, I think Mr. Wilson's already spoken to the fact that he's been there. He's crawled through the crawl space. He's seen the building. He knows that it, it would be difficult to move. It would be uh, prohibitively expensive. You have that testimony from him. Moreover, moving the house is irrelevant because that would go to whether there are feasible alternatives. You've already made that determination. It's one of the seven criteria. That's not why we're here tonight. We're not here tonight to revisit the seven criteria. The court has said, please make a finding as to practical difficulty. Please make a finding as to the building depth. And so that's, that's why we're here tonight, not to look at the seven criteria to re, redo what had done, been done already. With regard to uh, use permitted in the, the ordinance talks about whether a use is permitted in the zoning district. You know, let's go back to that practical difficulty test again. I know you've heard it a few times. I'm going to bore you saying it one more time. 
that the strict application of the ordinance to the property precludes the ability of the petitioner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located and results in significant economic injury to the petitioner. Mr. Fury and Mr. McCall are, are saying that what that means is to pursue a permitted use such as a residential use, and because it's always been a residential use, then there's no issue. It doesn't say that. It says a use permitted. What are some of the uses that you commonly make of a house, a residence? You can rent it in Higgins Beach. That's done frequently. You can use it as your home occupation. You can use it for a home office. Yeah, it isn't just permitted uses that are referred to here. And what Mr. Lynch has said is that the condition of the house and his state right now, as he's trying to preserve its original character, prevents him from being able to undertake uses that commonly are done with their single family residential house. So if we look at the ordinance the way it's written and not as others might wish it would read, it talks about the sorts of uses that, that Mr. Lynch has talked about already. Let's, I'm here, let's talk about building depth for one minute. Take a look at the character code, the, the Higgins Beach Character Based Zoning District. If you take a look at the, it's in Article 4, there, there's basically a listing of the different types of structures you can build, and one of them in the Higgins Beach District is a house. And when you look at that, there's no written verbal <coughs> definition of what building depth means. But if you look at the code, it, it says building depth 30, 38 feet max for the house, and then you look at where the letter B, which is what it's depicted as, it's shown it's along the length of the house. Just the house. Not any components. Not porches. Not additions. Building depth, 38 feet. You turn to the next page, and then you see separate components being discussed. Porches, wraparound porches, additions. It says Article 4C. You see that for dimensions. Well, it's not there, actually. It's in Article 4E. So there's a little typo in the ordinance. And when you look under 4E, it talks about what the length, the width, and the height can be of a porch and of an addition. So as Mr. Wilson said, you look at the base, the house, when you're looking at building depth. 38 feet is the limit. We're at 30, uh, 31 feet, 31.7 feet. That's something that the board can interpret. We don't need, an, we don't need a variance. If you think we need one, we'll apply for one. But we think that it's a matter of interpretation of your own ordinance. Building depth just relates to the, the, the length of the house structure, the basic house structure itself, and we meet it. And finally, just uh, so that you don't have to hear from me again, I hope, uh, on this. Again, practical difficulty is intended to be a less stringent test than undue hardship. It doesn't mean that it's without any test at all. There is a test. It's in the ordinance. We've gone through it. We believe we meet that test. And I, I think Mr. Lynch may have a couple of factual matters to bring up just to, to amplify what we're talking about here in practical difficulty. Um, yes. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's true. I don't want to destroy the character and antiquity of this old photographer's wagon, which my ancestors put there in 1850, and that was our living room. It's pretty amazing. But um, it's not so much that I don't want to do that, but as, as Walter said, and can clarify if you want, putting a code stairway, even if you destroy the old wagon, is the, we require losing either a living room, a kitchen, or a dining room. I would have to decide if I have to stick with my existing footprint, which of those rooms I can live without because I am making room for a code stairway. To me, that's denying a use that it's permitted for. Um, secondly, this encroachment issue, um, I, I'd like you all to, I handed out a survey when we first met. It's a very recent survey. It makes it completely clear that there is no encroachment I, you can look at it if you want. I think one of you guys is. The propane tank does not encroach. There's no cellar entryway, so it certainly doesn't encroach. My house is not on the line. Some places it's about a foot. Some places it's three feet. But it's just untrue to continue to repeat that he's doubling the house. It's 
the house is over the line. The propane, it's just not true. And you have lots of stuff already in the record to that effect. Another thing, not true. I did not buy the house in 1998. It's been in my family, as you know, for a long time. And I acquired equity interest many, many years before that. Um, it hasn't been occupied as a residence for 50 years. It's been a summer, rustic summer place until two years ago when I moved in and made it my primary residence. Um, so those are facts. That is truth. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be brief, and I'm going to sort of direct this at Phil. <laughs> Phil, I think with respect to the findings that need to be made, I respectfully disagree with Attorney Cassiofikas. Um, uh, uh, Judge Justice Mills vacated the board's decision, and in Attorney Cassiofikas' letter, he pointed out the board would need to remake its findings. But I think the point of her remand is that the findings that were made last time around, even on the seven items, were made globally, and she, and she concluded, and I think instructed this board, you need to make findings with respect to the loss of a permitted use and the substantial economic injury for each of the, of the two variances that were requested, rear addition and front addition, and you need to make findings on the seven points for each of those proposed additions, and therefore she hasn't left in place your seven findings, and you're not bound by, oh, I didn't think about it carefully last time, so I can't rethink it this time. There are plainly alternatives for the problem that the wiring is antiquated, that is, put in new wiring, and you don't need an addition to do it, and there isn't any evidence you need an addition to do it. Um, so I think you're entitled to think afresh about those issues, and I think under the Superior Court remand, you're required to and break down your thinking into rear side addition, front addition, 38 foot, 38 foot restriction, and getting a variance from that, and do it piece by piece on both whether there's a loss of a use and substantial economic injury. And if there is in each of those respects, whether the other seven criteria are met for each of those issues. I think that's what the justice has ordered the board to do, but. I assume you'll defer to Attorney Sosia's interpretation, and he's a smart lawyer, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. You want to say anything at this point on that? You know, I, I, I'll just read you, I'll just read you, and then I'll give you sort of my thoughts. The board's decision is vacated, and the case is remanded for further findings as to whether enforcing the setback requirements would create a practical difficulty, as that term is defined in Section V, B, 6, B of Respondent Town's zoning ordinance, the board should make for findings with regard to all proposed additions. VB6B is the definition of practical difficulty. So my reading is that she sent it back, the court sent it back, specifically for, to find findings on the practical difficulty definition because you did not do that the first time. So, so that's sort of what the whole sort of conclusion is about. So you do need to do that. I do read that findings that with all proposed additions, meaning the application itself. So to the extent there are different findings, you, you clearly have the discretion to do that if there are differences, but I think you also have the discretion to say, we're making these findings as they, are, as they relate to both variances. I just think you should make it clear in the record what you're doing. So to the extent you're doing it for both, make that clear. If you feel like there are different findings for both, make that clear. But we need to address the fact that there, that there are all, all proposed additions need to be addressed. Is, is that clear? Yes. Okay. Anybody comfortable with that? So in other words, so and to go further, one step further, I also, uh, as I said in my letter, because I, I saw the, the decision, decision was only being sent back on BB6B, the definition, that you could readopt and you would have to readopt your existing findings on the seven criteria because they were vacated. Okay. If we chose to look at one in particular for clarification, one of the board members in retrospect looks back and says, as, as Mr. McCall pointed out, that they're, they're, they may have had a second thought on that. That would be okay at this juncture also. Yeah, I'd like not. to hear it for the attorneys on that, but I don't, I don't see why you'd be prohibited from adding additional findings, but I don't think you have to. I don't think that's what the court asked you to do. Okay. Usually on a remand, or in, I don't know if you, anyone was here six years ago, I want to say was the last remand. Okay. 
And so you've been through it before. I think the chair has been through it before. And they are very specific. If you remember that last one, it was for a very specific purpose, and the, the rest of the decision was not disturbed, even if it was vacated. So um, in this case, I, I saw it being sent back for this particular reason, which is the definition of practical difficulty, and also in the, in the footnote to address the 38-foot limit. Thank you. Anybody else from the public like to speak on this? Any other people? Go ahead. I'm just going to respond to Attorney Saucier's um, point, sort of thinking out loud here. But one of the issues that we raised on behalf of Mr. Fury on the appeal was that to the extent the board's findings suggest the board thought you needed the addition to solve the egress upstairs, which the board's decision suggested, it was from looking at the record closely that I determined, well, you obviously don't because all of the larger windows are going in walls that aren't otherwise being changed. So the board was just wrong about that in my mind. And that was one of the issues we raised on the appeal with the justice, but she didn't reach that issue because she said preliminarily there just weren't adequate findings on this preliminary issue. So I think Attorney Saucier is right. You could just readopt your findings and, and say, well, we're not going to think about it carefully again, and then I'm going to go talk to her about the fact that those walls are big enough for the windows they want to put in. That's just a finding that people didn't think through. I don't mean, I don't mean to suggest you weren't careful, but you're busy people, and the, the opposition didn't didn't put the plans in front of you and say these windows are all going in existing walls. You don't need a variance for that. So I think that finding that you made, for example, was was plainly mistaken because it hadn't been thought through carefully. I think it'd be a mistake if I were your lawyer to say, well, send it back and have McCall explain that to the judge again and don't discuss it. But but that's um, I think he's right. You, you can do that. I just don't think it's wise. And you plainly can revisit any finding you made because she did remand it and send it and send it back to you, vacated your decision totally. So you're not limited in your discretion to revisit things that you've previously addressed, in my opinion. And I think Phil agrees with that. But thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cole. That's right. Everybody comfortable with that? Anybody else wish to speak? Yeah, either, either side and nobody else. Okay, I'm going to close the public portion of this meeting and we'll come to the board. Uh, board members. We'd like to discuss. I'll open up for both discussion. If you want to ask anybody a question, feel free, and we'll go. go ahead. One thing that has been surfaced: I wasn't here for the hearing last year, so I wasn't part of that decision. Um, but it was surfaced here, so I think it's fair to bring it up. The 38-foot setback has come up from both sides. I'd like to hear the town's opinion. Of the ordinance was enacted what two years ago now. Mm -hmm. something like that and I was a member of the board at that time I would like to hear the board's opinion on the 38 foot setback based on the intent of the ordinance not what's written but what was the intent when this was pulled together was it 38 foot overall or was it 38 foot for the body of the building then you add on a porch then you add on an addition was it really meant to be 38 feet overall the code is, is very specific in that the, the main box of the building, and of course the code, quite frankly, I'm going to couch it this way, the code was really developed for new structures. It really did not address existing non-conforming structures. In fact, there really wasn't even a section in the code on non-conformance. We are proposing amendments now that will deal with that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. But what we have done for other structures that were non-conforming mm -hmm. is we took the position that if the component that you added or the section of the building that you added was compliant and in the, in the compliant or conforming building window, as long as that was the case, and it met the code to the greatest practical extent because quite frankly there are some existing buildings that simply can't, because of the way they were structured or oriented on the lot, simply can't comply 100% with the code. Should that preclude someone from adding to their house or improving their structure when they're paying large tax dollars down at Higgins Beach? No. So we have to use some sense of reasonableness. And if somebody wants to challenge that, so be it. So, so the way we look at this, the way I looked at this, quite frankly, was that if, should the board approve the front addition, and the appellant was asking for relief on that front setback, 18 to 21 feet, because the house is already so far back. There was no condition in the code that said you have to pick the structure up and move it, although that's certainly a great option if you can do it. No requirement to do so. If 
you added that front addition, that 17 foot front addition, and you look at the components that are already there, and if you look at the screen, I'll try to show you, um, this, the, on the left hand side of this view that's on your screen, you see an existing porch on the rear. That whole porch clear up to, for, and for the entire length of the 31 foot 8 inch dimension, is one story. That, even though partially is, is enclosed, it is all considered porch. It's an enclosed, engaged porch. Part of it's open, part of it's closed. Therefore, that back section, the existing section of the house, starts to behave like a rear addition. Yes, it does encroach into the 30-foot setback. The whole house encroaches into the 35-foot setback, but it behaves like a rear addition. If you were to permit that front addition to go on there, that becomes the actual dwelling and it meets, it meets that 38-foot standard. The rear addition then is no longer than what would be allowed should the house be positioned and built new on the lot. I understand the um, abutter's position on that. My position was that behaved like a rear addition. The, the new part would behave like the real house, the, the, the main house, and, and the overall length was no longer than what we would permit if it was located on the lot. That's how I reviewed this and looked at it. Um, I think at the last hearing, I might have explained it differently. I, I explained it if you flip that house around, put the existing house on the front, put the uh, addition that he was asking on the back, then it would take a different form it would look like a rear addition. We don't allow rear additions on the front of the house. But there's nothing in the ordinance that says you can't add to the front of the house if you get relief on the front setback. And it is in the buildable window. That's how, it, that's how I looked at it. This little piece back here with the bathroom on it, don't really know what to call that because it's not really a side wing. A side wing is a multi-story uh, addition on the side. Um, it may be it's not really a porch because it doesn't meet fenestration. You've got a bathroom and a laundry in there. It's just an existing non-conforming piece of the structure. Can't make everything fit. But that's how I reviewed that. And, and um, to me, that made more sense than, than, than any way of looking at it. I don't disagree that that house exists in the rear setback. Always has and still will if this is approved or, or not. That's how I reviewed it. Thank you. Board members? I mean, I'm very comfortable with the town's interpretation of the 30 foot. I mean, I think you were very clear back in September, and Brian made a very good explanation. He just did again about the 30 foot. I mean, my understanding that wasn't even part of the original application because the town said this isn't, he doesn't need it. All the board members, comments, questions? I got another question. Fairly. Um, if I could have you stand up and address one question for me. Um, yes, please. Sure. Your house was raised at one point in time in the very recent past, I assume. Uh, yeah, it was like 25 years ago, maybe. Okay. And what was the intent for that raising of the building? Um, because, the, the, like a lot of the old houses, it was built on wooden posts and pilings. And the pilings, because it wasn't winterized with frost heaves, would, would move and every year and tumble over. Um, the wooden support structures would rot. So it, we stabilized it. I mean, we, we got a building permit from the town mm -hmm. for, for raising it, putting in a foundation, and putting it back down. But it was to stabilize it um, because the, those posts on pilings, as you may know, when some frosties, the basement, it didn't have a basement, it was open, um, move every winter and very difficult to maintain. It finally got to the point where it was starting to crumble down. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other comments, questions, thoughts from the board? So, I'll uh, try and put the thought, my reasons for justifying, and I, I still believe that the, it is reasonable to have uh, the property uh, not moved, although also allow for the uh, the reality that it's unlikely that something of that 
style, two by four construction. I mean, obviously the noise that uh, the next door neighbor actually acknowledged is probably because there's no insulation or very little insulation. And so you run into a whole bunch of problems with that, that property as a whole. I look at that and if you tried to move that, my guess is it would certainly exceed the 50% uh, cost of, of being able to move that. My guess is it would be uh, thousands of dollars more. So I don't think it makes sense to move that building. Furthermore, I don't think it's required to move the building because the envelope, in fact, is open there, and I think that gives us some flexibility. It's also in the middle of a lot of change with the ordinance rules. So I think we have a, a lot of moving targets here. When I think of whether or not this is a this has an economic injury, I don't know how that you could take that building as it currently sits and make it safe and bring it up to code and have the standard two by six construction, which is expected in northern New England. It's not in Massachusetts. Two by four construction is not in Massachusetts. In Maine, it's two by six, and there's a reason we're colder up here. So uh, that structure in and of itself to me is flawed. I don't think that, I think we've earlier determined that the property had some serious uh, structural defects. One of the reasons why on the right hand side that I felt comfortable to be able to, to allow that two foot bump out was because the applicant was removing about the same amount and bringing it more in compliance with the ordinance again not necessarily solving the problem because in in the circumstances as I see it, it's not a solvable problem. But it, it, what I mean by that is bringing it into an envelope with any reasonableness. I don't think it's reasonable to expect to kind of to knock it down and start over, which would certainly be an option. They'd still have to come back here. We'd certainly still have to approve it, and we probably would. But in his, if you look at our history, we approve things where they sit. If somebody came in, and said they wanted to approve some, build something, we'd say, fine, as long as you stay in the envelope, you already are. We may prefer them to move it forward, but I seldom, I don't remember a situation where we've mandated that they bring it more in conformance. I think they've always done that when it made sense. And I believe that Mr. Wilson would have also proposed that if it made sense, he would move that property. Because obviously his goal is to build a property that is structurally sound and functional. And I do believe that there are issues with that second floor and the, uh, the functional obsolescence of that floor. So what I'm getting at, I guess, is, is I looked back in the history, I watched the video again uh, before this meeting tonight, I've tried to rethink what, my, what I thought about why this was, why it rose to the level of uh, a hardship, an undue hardship, is if the, the the character and the design and the appeal isn't a factor, then yes, you can do anything. But the reality is it is a factor. And there is history there and there is relationship there. And it is reasonable to expect the applicant to want to have that retained, especially when you're talking about something that's hundreds of years old and history of the family. I don't think that is an unreasonable request. I also don't think it's reasonable to raise it up. I think it is too fragile. So. All of those things combined, when I think about whether or not there's an economic reason, I believe there is. He's also living there full time. It's not a safe property to live in. It's, it's not safe. Uh, and I, <coughs> could re, they could take the, the, the wiring and redo it. And they could do a lot of different things with it. But you've still got a two by four, hundred and some odd year old home that is not going to meet today's standards by any means. With the, the ceiling height is an issue, hey, I'm five six on a proud day. so. I guess I could get by with a five foot six ceiling, but that's a, I'm probably one of the few. So I don't think it's reasonable to expect a five foot six ceiling. And I do argue that it would be dangerous. The two foot stairwells uh, are too narrow by any standard. And so I do think that's a reasonable assumption to, to, to have to deal with that. I, uh, I know Mr. Warren, uh, I, I respect his work. Uh, although I, I don't think it is reasonable to expect somebody to do a drive-by and have an opinion that would be tied to uh, what has been done, uh, again, by uh, Mr. Wilson. So as all, although I do tend to agree that there are, under normal circumstances, a reasonable assumption that you could lift that up and move it, I think there could be. However, at what point does the, the, the dollars and the risk outweigh the factors of, of common sense? And I just don't think this 
this rises to that level. And again, it's not just it's not just that we're talking about the practicalness of it, but also the, the reasonableness of it. Is it reasonable to us to expect them to do that as a board? And I don't think it is reasonable as a board to meet that standard to make them do that. So, in my opinion, and I'd like everybody to challenge me on this, I believe that that standard is met easily. And the, the property as it sits doesn't make, it needs to have something done to it. And if you're going to do it, you need to do it right. I believe that they do have the right to use that envelope, although I don't think that's been totally defined, but I believe the envelope is open. They are in the building envelope. Numerous times we've discussed they could do on other files that they could do something with their, they, if they stayed in their building envelope, they can do what they want. I don't see that as necessarily part of this process, although it is, it is encompassed in the whole mix, and that's why I think you have to take this holistically. The, the reality is that the new ordinance allows for a totally different set of circumstances that, that, than we had before. It, the building envelope hasn't changed. That's still allowed. It's an open building envelope. Now, all of a sudden, we're not even bringing it into compliance by bringing that property forward and putting the deck on. It's still out of compliance. He would have to bring it out another 20 feet or so to bring it into compliance with a new, new ordinance. And that's not reasonable either. So just as absurd as it is to build it up, try and move it and take the damage and the risk and the cost, it's equally absurd for us to expect to move that forward to meet the new zoning regulations. I also think that Mr. Longs is accurate with being able to flip. When you look at it from the point of view of you're taking this new structure, you've got all the components of the main house being built in the new section. You've got the kitchen in there. You've got the, the, the heavy-duty parts of the house. And the, the stairway, whether or not it could be in a different location or not, it isn't in this proposal. So it is the core of the building is there. It's in that new structure. So I think it is reasonable if one chose to use the argument that now that becomes the back and this becomes the front. I don't choose that and look at it differently, but I think that's a reasonable assumption and I think any board member could take that position. I think there are multiple ways that board members individually can look at this case. So when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at side setback, number one. Is that reasonable and consistent with what we'd expect? Well, they're making it more in conformance. That's what we always use as a gauge. Are we rewarding a behavior? Yes, because the other side, we're allowing that two feet to come out to give them more height there, but ultimately, it puts us more in conformance, and so consequently, I have no problem inside of that overall box to let them have more room there because they're actually working with us to solve or improve a certain situation. So I believe that the side setbacks are met, and the logic is, is sound to allow that to take place, and I think it does make sense. I do agree with the window issue. I think that's very accurate. I think Mr. McCall is dead on on that. But I don't think that's the issue at hand. I don't think we ever even talked about the window issue. That really wasn't part of my decision in the process. My decision was what's the right thing to do based on the realities of this property. When I look at, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here shortly, but uh, when I look at, again, the front of the property, the new ordinance re almost requires that you use the, 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 they want to see, the town wants to see decks and porches on the front. It really, in, it rewards that behavior with the new ordinance. Whether or not that's the intent or not, I don't know, but it certainly does reward that behavior because it says you can use other rules if you do this, if you meet our design standards. And the town is not, this, design standards are not new to this town. The town has got one on Route 1, and, and they've, they've applied that very thoroughly, and they've, it's a reward process, in my opinion, watching what's been done, and my building is an example of that. So I don't, I don't see that as being an issue at all. I don't see the 38 feet as being an issue because, again, they've got a building envelope that they've got a right to build. And if you go with Brian's logic, which I think is sound, you could flip it. I think that realistically they've got a right to do that anyways. And, again, it's consistent with it. And they don't even need – when I looked at this, I said they're actually coming here to get an exception for the fact that they can't get all the way to the front where they should be. So those are, a, when I try to piece it all together, and it's not a neat box. I don't have a neat answer for it. I don't have a, it's not nice and defined. But when you look at the things that have gone on, you've got a hundred and some odd year old building. You've got a property that's not 
but he's right. It's right up against the line. I don't like that. I wouldn't like that if I were them. But it's there. So that's a fact. It's there. So the question is, is it impeding more on the back neighbor? I do not believe it is impeding more on the back neighbor. I believe that if you do those repairs, it will actually make it more soundproof because you'll be using current structures as opposed to... So I actually think, although the applicant, the neighbor would certainly prefer to have that property moved away from the line, it's not. And that's not the request, and it's not required to be the request. And so the, the only benefit I see is positive for the back neighbor because it should end up reducing the sound and pushing the, the, the main activities of the home to the front of the home as opposed to the side or the back. So that's kind of my overview of, of uh, why I believe we've, we've made the right decision back in September and why I, I believe it's the right decision today. And uh, I'll let the board talk and from I, there. And I think if I can add to the chair's comments, I think the three things that we're here to decide tonight based on Mr. Saucier's uh, direction to us um, as being part of the town is that we are here for those three questions. The definition or approaching the definition of practical difficulty and how we applied it to this case back in September. Uh, the applicant's 38 foot depth and how we believe the ordinance allows that or does not allow that. That was the quest, second question. And then the third one was the findings. I don't think we're here to rehash the findings of what what was decided last time. I just believe we're here to state the reason and I think you started doing that for the decisions that were made during the last case. The side also I think is an issue. I think we because of the, the site movement on the side. So I think that's a separate issue too. Okay. That wasn't brought up at the beginning. I did or I didn't hear that, so I'm fine with that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have said that, but what I'm saying is I think your points have been around item three. Right. So it, can we go through the other two items? to start getting definition on those so that we can start pulling our findings of facts together. And I really need the board to, to participate on this process so we can get it on the record. So the, the first question is, what do you believe is the justification for uh, the allowing a practical difficulty based on what you know and what you've studied? And four of us have voted on this before. What was your reasons before that you decided that? We didn't publicly state it the way it should have been done. And that was my error. So, but. To be candid with you, I thought it was pretty clear. So when I did it, I didn't really think of it as a separate line item because I thought it was extremely clear that this is a property that needed help. And I think we stated that over and over. We didn't separately address it. The judge is absolutely correct, and she had the right and the responsibility to do what she did and have no problem with that. So can we start by reading the definition of the practical difficulty so first? Feel free. Do you know where it is? I don't want to get it, it wrong. Is, uh, a case where I can read it in. A case where the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. So it's, it's two components, almost three components in there. So let's take it in pieces. A case with a strict application of dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which the variance is sought would preclude the use of the property which is permitted in the zone. Well, you basically, it's a single family home. You could have uh, an office in there. I believe that's the two things that the attorneys both mentioned, that this, it's limited to basically those two uses in that zone. I don't think there's anything else. Mr. Saucier, would you agree with that? Mr. Well, Saucier. What, one of the things that, that you're being asked to debate is does it preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone? You've heard two different arguments about how that would be interpreted. One is, and we really, uh, I, I agree with uh, Attorney Casavigas, we really don't have a lot of guidance from the court on this. Quite frankly, we have one superior court case. We don't have a main Supreme Court case on this. So we're kind of acting in that, in that uh, without guidance from the courts. So um, it's, the applicant has argued that it precludes a use that, you know, of the property which is permitted such as a home office, rental property, other types of uses that they normally could do without a variance. The abutters are arguing the opposite, which is that they could, they can have a single family house here with or without a variance. That's a permitted use. I don't know the answer to that. We don't know the answer to that because the courts haven't answered that for us. But that's something that you're asked to debate tonight. Okay. Um, 
the only the only guidance we have is from that Superior Court case, and and that case uh, suggested that there, it, it, in my view, more of uh, the latter, more of what Attorney Katsafikas suggested, which was, and this is what actually we argued in in the brief, but we're back before you, which is that it's a use that you could normally do, it was normally permitted in the zone without without the variance, um, such as some of the uses that were being defined tonight. Um, but there, but that is one interpretation. There's multiple interpretations of that. The important thing is what you guys decide tonight, based on what you've heard. Thank you. Okay. So uh, why don't we start with so now that with Ms. Shoup? Well, we talk about permitted uses, and um, I think you know Higgins Beach is very. I mean, it's a very big place for rentals and stuff, and so I think it's a very solid argument. And I mean, I think Peter Butter, who is here opposing, is enjoying the same things of being able to rent his property where, I mean, that is, you know, at some point a loss of income almost where you cannot recoup that in the summer where a lot of residents by Scarborough are participating that, especially in the beach town uh, neighborhood. So your position on that is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but your, your logic there as far as the meeting this requirement of, of uh, practical difficulty is what? Yes, I felt he had enough based on the fact that he couldn't rent it? And that's just one of the, I mean, to me, that's one of the biggest issues. Okay. Do you have others that you want on the record? Um, no. Okay. The way I look at it is uh, the practical difficulty is <coughs> he has a structure. He wants to make changes to it. And the structure doesn't coincide with the current zoning regulations. And the improvements that he wants to make improves the building, improves the neighborhood, uh, and improves everything. One of the things that Mr. Sherry pointed out, and primarily the only thing that he was complaining about was noise. Um, if you take a look at the design of the the new house, um, the dining room in the old house was in the back. Yeah, I can understand with no insulation and everything like that. It could be a lot of noise. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing, nine weeks down at Higgins Beach in the summertime, it's noisy all over. It is terrible at times. There's no way that you can prevent noise going from one cottage to another when they're so close together. But I think they've done a nice job here, redesigned, they put the study in the back, moved the dining room forward and the living room forward. I think that's going to reduce any noise going back. Plus, you're going to have insulation and so forth. Um, I think he, uh, he fully meets the practical difficulty. What is the, the uh, just for clarification for my sake here, what is, the, what is your position regarding the economic injury and why that uh, he can't do something as it sits if he wanted to just do something as the property sits, as, as Mr. McCauley pointed out? Why is that not a? Why is that not reasonable? But to do something exactly what, the way it sits. Yeah. Well, he's got a piece of history inside that that house, um, and I know an awful lot of people on the beach would hate to see that history go, just because somebody says. Hey, uh, you know, you got a <coughs> new stairway in, the only place you can put it in is in the middle, and your wagon has got to go. That's not that's not the right thing to do. Um, as far as an economic hardship, <coughs> moving it is an economic hardship. I, I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to do the cheapest thing that he could possibly do 
improve the property the best that he can possibly do. Uh, and, I, and I think he's doing it. It's, it's, I don't know how else to answer it. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, my thoughts on this in regard to the permitted use, um, you know, he's saying that due to uh, insurance limitations, whether insurance, liability insurance, whether it's available or or uh, or not, um, obviously using it as a home office, using it as a rental use, as Ms. Shoup said, um, you, there's a lot, there's a financial uh, economic injury here because it's a loss of potential income. Uh, whether or not insurance may be made available, but that could also be, in my view, is that is also an economic injury because the insurance for that would be so high uh, because of the narrow staircases for meeting ADA regulations and code, um, you know, potential for falls and injury, and then lawsuits and everything else. Uh, that leads to uh, economic injury. Um, my other thought, my other thought is that again, it was mentioned the improvements move the building more in conformance. And then additionally, uh, not to uh, repeat anything else that anyone else has said, but I'll point out that um, based on the land survey done by licensed land survey in 2016, uh, the building and everything, though it is close to the line, it doesn't show that it is encroaching past the property line into uh, the adjacent lots. And we did require the removal of the tank, didn't we? I think we required that to be moved. Right? I can't remember what no. No, I don't think so. Okay. Sir. What about you, Mr. Lazy? Well, in some ways I'm struggling a bit with this <coughs> because, again, the way this is written is both sides of this question have to be met. So the applicant has to find that they are being taken, their, their right is being taken away from being able to use the property in the way they want to and they have to have an economic injury at the same time. It's not one or the other. Um, so if we, don't, if we don't allow this appeal to go through, I'm having a hard time with the economic side. Because <coughs> if you don't let it go through, the property is going to sit as it is. You have to look at a different way of doing it, possibly trying to come back for another appeal. And to me, is that economic injury enough to say that that would be met if we didn't approve this? And I'm struggling with that a bit. Um, just as we usually do, mm -hmm. banter it. Um, Please. To me, the the question would come down to being what it's reasonable to expect them to be able to improve the property, make it safe, have it usable year round. That that is my personal opinion. That would yes. be consistent with everything else. Yes. It's unreasonable as it sits to be able to do that. Would we agree with that? Yes. So then it comes and down I to think that it becomes to precluding, right? Whether they can use it in right. the in the fashion it's supposed to be zoned for. Exactly. And so I agree with that. So, so, to me, with that. so to me, the challenge comes back to what's it going to cost to do that, and then at what point, and I think Mr. Longstead can answer this question, what is the trigger that you have to go to meet all current zoning? What, is there a trigger point? Nothing. So they could do three quarters of it, and nothing, nothing's going to trigger it, just other than getting approved for the town. Okay. So if the building were to be moved into the envelope, not that it fits the envelope, but if they were, it were to be moved close to the envelope, do we have a feel for what that cost might be? Was that part of the decision-making process? Swag? And could you step up to the podium and, and answer that? Thank you, Mr. Wilson. You may not be prepared to answer that. I'm not prepared with actual figures I've done. Okay. But if you just look at moving the house, taking out the foundation, filling in the hole, taking all the utilities and redirect all the underground utilities, mm -hmm putting in a new foundation, all the landscaping around the property would be destroyed, it'd have to be all done over. You're looking at easily in excess of fifty and maybe approaching eighty to ninety thousand dollars okay. more. And I would agree with that number. Okay. And you've been in the industry for a while. So fifty two you do years. have some level of expertise. Yes. You've earned that gray hair. Yes. <laughs> and if I may, can I say one thing? Please. It may be not in line, but I want to say this. 
I believe you're interpreting in that practical difficulty loan where it says it will preclude the use of the property to permit it in the zone. Yeah. Use is a funny term in zoning. Use procures to residential, business, industrial, commercial. That's not what the practical difficulty is about. It's a use of the property which is permitted in the zone. Putting an addition onto a residence which is in use in the zone is how you use that property. And putting an addition onto a building is permitted as a use of that property. Right, but you are coming for an appeal yes. to get that use. Because anybody can do it if it yes. falls in the envelope. Yeah, but we aren't coming for an appeal to change the zoning use from commercial Correct. to residential. Or Correct. Something. Correct. Here's what's interesting about that dialogue right there. When I look at that appeal, and I originally read it, part of the the the, the, the tension of the needs. One of the reasons they had to come to the appeal is because they don't, even though they've got an envelope, they don't meet the new requirements. New requirements would require them to build it dramatically deeper into the property. Certainly. So you've got two competing issues there. You've got the, the old code. You've got the, the, the right to be able to build in your own envelope, but you can't mm -hmm. because you're not meeting the new regulations, which means you have to come for variance to be able to meet that or practical difficulty. And so I see a, the challenge for the applicant is how do they meet all of those competing needs? And I think that at some point it's not reasonable to, uh, from a cost point of view. And that's where I'm going. My argument wasn't around the first part of that qu question. It's the second part, the economic, economic hardship. So if you could please step back up. Sorry. <laughs> you move the structure for, say, seventy-five dollars to $100,000. Yeah. You've still got an old building exactly. with the same conditions that it were there. Right. So now you've got to put money into the building, and you're putting some value into that property to get it so that it's livable, so you get a staircase that's within code. Exactly. <clears throat> now, once you've done that, how much of the existing property value has increased as a result of that? Say if you put another 100000 into it to still have an old building, but you just have a good staircase, and you haven't really improved it that much. You put 200 into it, what's the current value, and what's the percentage of the property's value that you've affected? Well, I'm not a real estate broker or an appraiser, but I can tell you one of the things they look at is the amount of square footage depends on the value as well as the condition of the building. If you end up with the same size square footage you started with, you mm -hmm. haven't increased that square footage, so the only place you're going to gain any value in the value of the property is based on what the appearance and what you've put into that existing structure is. So just improving the inside of the house and keeping the same square footage and maybe losing one of the rooms on the first floor or a good portion of that room to get in a compliant stairway mm -hmm. and also the same thing happening upstairs by getting a compliant stairway up on the second floor which has a hallway up from bedroom to bedroom that's only two feet wide right now you're going to be taking more space out of that second floor and probably end up losing at least one bedroom on the second floor so you're going to end up with a loss of rooms on the same square footage that will decrease the value of the existing house Okay. Even though you update it and approve it. Right. And I, I guess my line of questioning is trying to lead you to answer the question that you put 20 or 30 percent into the property and haven't gained any more value. Exactly. That's what would happen. Okay. That to me would be an economic hardship I because you haven't gained anything and you put that much money into the property. You've moved it away from the property line, but have you really gained anything? And the Bigger answer, bill. I think, is no. Yeah. you got a stairwell that you can go up now, but the property value really hasn't increased. you put a little bit more space between you and the abutter. Mm -hmm. There's still a potential for noise because you've only probably added 20 feet right. space between the two. And the kitchen is in the same place. And you still have an open building that has a bunch of noise coming out of it. So uh, to me, that would be an economic hardship, and now you would meet the second portion of that question, and I'm okay. But I didn't want to give you the answer. Okay. Thank you. you failed my test. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions for Mr. Lynch. Dealing in the insurance aspect of it, as I do, um, 
when were like approximately the roof, furnace, plumbing, heating, when were they updated last? Are they all really old? Yeah, okay, so the roof, I think, don't hold me to it, I think it's probably 30 years old. Okay. And one of the things we plan to do is, without changing where the roof is, put a new roof on it, the shingles. Um, what was the other thing? The uh, furnace. Well, yeah. it never had a furnace. Uh, it still doesn't have a furnace. I moved in a couple of years ago. I put a uh, Renai propane heater, um, which is barely adequate. Actually, it's pretty pretty cold in the winter because I didn't want to do a big uh, furnace for a couple of years because I was planning to do a the substantial remodeling. So I've been kind of limping along with a little Renai, but it, I don't know if that's considered a furnace or not, but that's the furnace. Source. Yeah, that's fine. And what else? Um, your electrical, is it fuse? Oh, yeah, is it knob and tube? Is it it's that 100 amp, 200 amp? Uh, Ralton knows what it's called. It's, it's metal t a spiral wire. What's it called? That's the cable. That's the cable that wires in. Yeah, but you had a word for it last time. It's, it's uh, Belden? Knob and tube. And tube. Yeah, I not think. All of it. All right, not all and it's of it. it's being used right now. The number two, okay. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was plumbing. Um. Let's see. Well, the plumbing. Just roughly, it doesn't have to be. Included. Yeah. Oh, I know. When we raised it, which I think was twenty or thirty years ago, we replaced some of the copper pipe with PVC underneath. I think that was the most recent update of the plumbing. Last question. I know we talked about rental, but you said this is now your primary residence. You don't have the intent of renting it now, right, when you're doing this? Because you said I, this is no, now your I, primary I residence. I, I don't. Um, I wouldn't like to remain, have that option precluded, but I actually don't plan to rent it. I'm very happy living there, and um, it is my sole and only residence. Uh, I don't have any other houses anywhere. Um, so, no, I don't plan to rent it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of things that he just addressed. Good. One of the things from an insurance aspect, you cannot have no knob and tube wiring in your house. It has to be replaced. It's not something you can get an insurance policy on. Knob and tube will not be written. Um, most places looking for furnace, they're not looking for a regular Renai portable heater. They're looking for some type of stable heat source that's in there. Roofing would generally, all the carriers, you can go to surplus lines, you can, get, you can still get coverage if you have a roof that's over 30 years, but just about all the carriers are looking for 25 years for a newer roof. He's 30 years out, so he's got a roof that doesn't make it. He's got knob and tube wiring in there that doesn't make it. Plumbing's probably okay, but the heat source is a little bit iffy. I mean, like you said, you can possibly get something through a surplus lines type carrier for thousands of dollars more than a regular homeowner's policy would cost you. So I, I do see that as an economic impact. If you were to rent it, you'd have to have two, two separate means of egress on the outside. That's what they look for when they look at that. So you've got to have a stairwell going outside and a stairwell in the front of the house or whatever. If having it in the middle of the house, they're not going to look for that. They're going to look for two means of egress from the top floor and the bottom floor. I ran into that with a policy I was doing with someone in Portland. They had to have two means of egress. We couldn't, couldn't find a carry unless it was surplus lines for them. Even if the windows are appropriate size? Yeah, because you've got a certain distance up. It depends upon how high the end windows are. You've got to be able to hang from the window and drop without breaking body parts. So, I mean, if the windows are 20 feet up, <laughs> that's not really a safe means of egress. It's a smaller window, even if you've got a newer window in there. So, I mean, those are just some of the things that I see. I see it does meet. That would be an economic impact. I mean, renting it, if you said you're not going to, or you don't want to preclude it, but there are other things that go along with the rental of a unit and other things that you'd have to have upgraded. And it's kind of, like you said, it's kind of iffy the uses. <laughs> we really can't determine that. I mean, he's saying he wants to use it as home office. That's permitted in the, in the use. He says he wants to use it for his dining room and living room. That's permitted in the use. They're saying you can use it as a primary home. Yeah, that's permitted in the use too. Which one is it? Does he get to use his office and still keep his dining room and still keep his living room without taking those out and keep his bedrooms upstairs so he only has one bedroom to sleep with if the halls need to be wider for the stairwells? I don't know. I think there's an argument to be made that that is 
permitting a use. So your your argument regarding the practical difficulty, uh, the, the um, an economic injury, are you saying that based on all of that information? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can get insurance policies for anything, but it's going to cost you quite a, quite a lot of money, and you're going to have to redo some stuff. I mean, once they find out knob and tube is working in there, no insurance carrier really wants to touch that. It's a total fire hazard. It's one of the first questions people ask when they go out and do it, is there any live knob and tube? And inspectors will go and look, and they'll take pictures, and if they see live knob and tube, they'll write back to the insurance company and say, this is live knob and tube, because they can tell. They have a little test that they put up there, and it tests it. It shows it's live. But I, I get, coming back to... Yeah, economic injury. But coming back to the, uh, the butters issues or comments, they could do that with the property not moving. They could do that now. So you're right about the, that being an economic challenge, but they don't have to do the, the expansion based on... Well, I would think one of the expansions would be that second means of egress. Second, that, that, that's a legitimate point. And also, I would say losing a bedroom or losing another space is a legitimate point. That would make sense. Yeah, I mean, they could do it, but they're going to lose some stuff out of this. So, so your, your position, again, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth here, so I'm trying to, to, to let you speak the way you guys choose. This is not about me. It's about the right answer. So what I, tied to the fact that they've got to look at this property and say, and the court's going to look at this, and the applicant and his attorney's going to look at this as they should, and we've got to make sense if we believe in what we believe or we need to override what we believe and, and go to whatever the right answer is needs to be the right answer. It's not about being right or wrong. It's the right answer. Well, like you said, we've been consistent with what we do. If it's within the envelope and they're trying to make it more within the envelope, we generally allow people to do that. That's been right. a consistency that we've always done. You're right. As long as people are coming within that envelope and they're trying to get within that envelope, we've allowed them to do some of these things. And I don't think just doing it, I, I don't know. From, from a building perspective, I mean, Mr. Wilson told us there may be different things. We've got someone that did a drive-by of it. They didn't go out and look at the building. I don't, I don't know. I mean, they could put bigger windows in there, and they may mess up the structure. I mean, what did you say? One piece is like a wagon in there or something like that? What's to say they don't, they do this, and they keep it where it is, and don't do the renovations and things, and the wagon falls down, and the whole house caves, caves in on where it is? I mean, you could unsturdy the structure if you're doing some of these things. I don't know. I'm not a builder. <laughs> okay. Other comments on Mr. Sauter, anything? So I think I, I've been taking notes, but at this point I think you should take a motion on that one. the first one, let's say, the practical difficulty. Um, and the person who makes the motion states, uh, summarizes the reasons that they've heard, whether it's a, a, that it doesn't meet or that it does meet. Summarize the reasons, you can deliberate and then vote on that. Okay. I'd also recommend, consistent with what we've said before, we've, if you make a motion that it does meet, um, that you make a motion to say whether it's for both editions or one of the editions. So clarify, in other words, here, because that was one of the things the court asked. Three, would it be three or just two? Beside the, do the deck, the porch, and the edition, the or would it just be the edition well, and the side? I think you really could break it into the front the front edition and then the side edition that's in the rear right. uh, okay. setback. Those are really the two asks. I guess sort of a, to take a step back, I guess the 38-foot length issue, if you decide it, it fits within the ordinance as is, in other words, they're allowed to build the length that they want to build based on the ordinance, then that would not be a, considered a variance and it would be just those two, the front and the side. If you decide the opposite about 38 foot, then there'd be, quote, three additions that you'd be talking about. Let's talk about the 38 foot. Yeah, why don't you do that first? Because that would affect <coughs> your finding on the variance. Mr. Long says, I'm yeah. pretty clear with that, though. Yeah. I, I, it, number one, I do think Mr. Long says, is very clear on it. But however, you could very easily argue that Mr. Long says, I've interpreted it improperly. I, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not, I don't, I want to make sure again that we're doing the right thing the right way. I look at the the 38, and they're actually allowed, when you do the math, it's 62 feet. I think one of the one of the attorneys made a comment about that. You can actually get out 62 feet. I think you're talking semantics when you start talking about whether or not the, the back is, you can only build out on the back, but you can't build out on the front. You've got a building envelope that's open on the front. That's allowed to be built on. 
So if he's just building that addition in, his opinion, <coughs> in that envelope and the new code in the new requirements weren't in place, if we're looking at the old ordinance, he could look and build in that envelope. And he wouldn't have to come to us as far as I see it. Does anybody disagree with that logic? I totally agree with that logic. So the, the, the trigger that's actually forcing the hand isn't the fact that he wants to build an addition on and make it that section. The trigger is the fact that when he does that, he's not in compliance with the new ordinance. So you've got, and then you've also got the new ordinance. In, in, which, in which way are you referring that he's not in compliance with the new ordinance? In, I think you need to make that clear. I think that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, well, the new ordinance requires that the property is pushed toward the road, toward the street. That's not about, and I don't believe it's about, and I know the, uh, the butter made a comment about it, I don't believe it's got anything to do with giving people more privacy in the backyard. The, 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 we've seen enough of the way the town does its planning, and it likes great American neighborhood style personalities, for lack of a better term, uh, where the, the streets are walkable, friendly, inviting, Everything about the new ordinance is designed to make it appealing to uh, to be in a neighborhood, a, a, a warm sense of, of home. It's it's almost a Norman Rockwell kind of a concept, is, that, is how I interpret it. And I think it's, I don't think it has anything to do with how big the lot, how big the unit is. Again, I think you have to look at the unit's there. It's already there. It's, it is what it is. It's there and it's sitting there. If you come back to the current regulations, the new ordinance, they cannot build that small a unit on that front without coming to us because it doesn't meet the new setbacks. So what is it? The, I don't want to I don't want to make up numbers, but how many feet from the road and how many feet? 18, 18 to 21 feet. Is so 18 to 21 feet. They don't get there. They don't get there. So they don't meet the current ordinance. They have to come here just to be able to get to, to add on. Whereas again, if the ordinance wasn't there, they could do it without even batting an eye. And the side is a consistent change that we've done over and over again, as you pointed out. Uh, with them. We've, we've, we said, look, are they more, is it bringing it more in compliance? The answer is yes. Is that new piece coming out going into deeper than what it would normally be? No, it's not. And uh, it's coming to the side where the applicant actually the next door neighbor is fine with it. But it's, it's allowing for more practical use of the property and safer use of the property. It is, you're taking the kitchen and you're moving it to the front. That is going to drive the traffic, but nobody's different. So when I look at all, all this piece, I, mean, I get scattered on this a little bit, so I apologize because I'm not moving parts, but I think it comes back to there is no other alternative for them to have come to the board for an appeal. And it's a bizarre reason that they're coming to the board as opposed to what you think they'd be coming to. They're coming to the board because it can't, the development, the expansion they want to do can't meet or doesn't meet the new ordinance, which is a twist on this thing. It, it, you've still got the side, it's a different issue, but the front part is, is one thing. And then the deck or the front porch is allowed. That's obviously allowed per the ordinance. Again, that's not even an issue. It's celebrated. So it, it, they want you to bring that closer. And the whole unit is how many feet long? Uh, 54, is that what it is? 54, I think. Which is eight feet short of the... 47 okay. feet total. And realistically, you could get the 62 feet. So the 38 number is somewhat arbitrary in this case. I think it comes back to being, if that were new construction, that would apply. Old construction, I think it's arbitrary. I don't think it applies to the situation at all. And I think it, much like we had a previous uh, appeal where we looked at it and said the new ordinance doesn't fit that odd circumstance and we overrode the new ordinance because of that. I think this is the same kind of thing. That the ordinance didn't anticipate this twist. Uh, that's kind of what I'm looking at. Mr. Longstaff, what was it you were saying that was more catered to the new construction as opposed to the old construction? I know you meant made a comment about that in the new, or, the new ordinance, that it was more, something was more catered to new construction as opposed to an existing older structure, or maybe I'm just... Um, are you referring to um, my, my statement that the existing structure, if, if you added the proposed new structure on the front, the 
existing structure then behaves like a rear addition? Yeah, I believe so. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. And I think you, all, you also had made a statement that <clears throat> when the ordinance was written, it was really written about building new properties and creating that character that you're looking for, and we're kind of applying that to modifications to existing structures. Just two, two <clears throat> things for clarification for, to help Phil and I <laughs> as we're noting this stuff. I think I heard you say that one of the reasons why the side, one of the reasons you're stating you feel the side, um, uh, the two-foot side addition in the rear setback is justified is that they're removing the two-foot section <coughs> from that rear part of the building, that little side wing Correct. that's about 12 foot six long, and they're basically replacing that into that Correct. section in between the side wing and the new structure. Is that what I'm hearing that's you exactly say? Right. And it's still not bringing it out to its maximum use. They're just bringing it out a little bit. They're okay. not bringing it even to the whole side there. And, and something else that somebody, uh, nobody seems to have addressed, and I just want to point it out, I, it's neither, it's just a statement of fact, is that trying to relocate the existing building forward, if you look at the buildable envelope, you only have a very short window of opportunity there before it narrows down to about 19 feet, and the existing structure is over 23 uh, feet wide. So even if they moved it forward within about 20 feet, maybe less, they'd have to come back to the board for variance on the side setbacks because they would then be encroaching on the side. And also moving forward, if you look at the two structures next door, you can see on each, on the left and the right, in this view on your screen, there are two structures right there. There are no structures to the side of it over here, and you've got a, a, a little more open space. But that, I'm just trying to, as a statement of fact, I think that's one of the reasons why they're proposing to do what they're doing, because relocating the structure really doesn't buy them anything, okay. um, unfortunately, because of the configuration of the lot. Just a statement of fact. I was they'd still be in the same predicament they're in now by moving it forward and just have to come back. It, and that's fine, and they could do that. I'm not saying they couldn't do that. They could certainly come back and ask for a variance for that. But I'll take a shot at the diff, uh, definition of practical difficulty and help me add on if, as you see. I believe that I'll take a, I move that we approve or accept the definition the practical difficulty has been met and the cause uh, just to, that uh, the use of the property and the economic injury is substantial enough to justify hitting that trigger, not only globally, but also on each of the individual items, all seven of the, the items that we've done, because obviously that's how I believed when we first approved it, and I believe the board believed that too. I'd like that on record, but I believe the board, that before it voted, when we did that, already established the fact that those seven items needed to be triggered. They were triggered by the need for moving this in the, in the way it is. So, issues are, go ahead. Yeah. Let's finish the 38 foot thing. Did we do that? Yeah. I think we did. Let's take a vote on, or take a yeah, motion on that. I've heard discussion and I've got facts that we'll bring back to the board I proposed uh, okay. findings of fact, but why don't you take a, take a motion and vote on whether or not uh, the building feet. can only be 38 feet on the ordinance or that it can be longer based on the reasons you guys have been discussing. Okay. Uh, I believe that the applicant is allowed to do it and the 38 foot can be breached and go even longer is based on the information that we heard from the town in saying the uh, basis of the ordinance was to allow that 38 feet on the major portion of the building and then when you add the porch or any additions off the other end of the building that it could go all the way up to 62 feet so I think that clearly says that the 38 foot depth was allowed. You making a motion on that? Uh, anybody else care to comment? Because I don't think we've commented on the 38. So I, I have. You have. Yeah. You guys, are, I'm not sure you have. No, my comments, my comments mimic Lois Ells in this. I have nothing really to add. I agree with the town's interpretation. I think Ms. you answered it, I believe. But feel free to say it again. No, I think I expressed before that I agree with the town's interpretation. And I think it's important to be consistent because, you know, there have been appeals before, or there haven't been appeals before, where other people who have come before didn't need to come before the zoning board for this depth issue. 
<coughs> and I agree with the town's interpretation. So, Mr. Blazer, you want to take a shot at a... Uh, uh, make a motion to uh, agree with the original decision around the uh, applicant allow being allowed to build to a depth of 38 feet and that the existing ordinance supports that and the, the board has made the decision to support that as well. I don't think the number is right. There. It isn't? Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I think that the depth mm -hmm. of the building is going to be... 54. Uh, well, <laughs> no, it's, four, it's 48 and change. Okay. Um, I think we've stated that in the original findings. It was 48.6. The principal dwelling would then be 48.6. And, and we're agreeing, I, I, what I'm hearing is that the board is agreeing that that 48-6 is not just the principal building, but the way that it connects to the existing building, making it a rear addition. That, that was right? my interpretation, yeah. and everybody's okay. saying you agree with that. That's, Correct uh, me if I'm wrong. No, that's right. dead right. Okay. Thank you. Everybody agree with that? You want to vote on that? Uh, well, it needs to be put in the form of a motion for just time. Yeah, I'm going to try to restate it for you. Please yeah, want it yeah please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the motion is that the applicant can build 48.6 feet under the code and is not limited to 38 feet. Okay, thank you. The 38 foot depth. Just make it straightforward and simple. All right, good. Right. And then you obviously we also have your reasons which I've been drafting based on what you're saying. But I'll, I'll move that motion as, as you stated. Second. Uh, second. Discussion on that motion. No. Uh, I think we've got to be careful about saying 48 feet. I don't see where you're seeing 48 feet. That's 48.6, was it, as currently designed? If you add the, if you add the dimensions, go to the floor plan page, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> if you add the dimensions stated on the drawing. 46 and a half. You have 31 foot 8. You have 15, 6, Seven. 1 foot 4. But that doesn't include the porch. We. We don't have to include the porch because the porch is allowed to exist on the front of the building okay. and encroach anyway, okay. so it's immaterial. Okay. So that's 46, 6. No, if my math is so. Do it again. Okay, 31, 8. Well, there's a little push out of. I added that one foot inches. 4. Yeah, the push out is 48, 46. Okay. With that push out. Okay. <laughs> Wrong again. <laughs> okay, so I have that motion down. All right, great. So, any further discussion on the motion? No. Nope. All in favor? That's unanimous. Okay, thank you. So, we come back to the, the other seven questions. Okay. Question. So, let's answer the practical difficulties. And so, just to clarify, what we'll do is usually in some of these cases, we'll bring back the finding, we'll bring back draft findings based on your discussion. So, based um, on the information, based discussed. on the information and based on your discussion. Are, is, that's the findings you'd like that you've been discussing. I'll bring that back. Brian will draft or I'll help him draft it. You'll review that to make sure that it's clear at your next meeting, and then you'll adopt it. Okay. okay? That sounds fine. That'll be signed at that time. They'll be signed, right. Okay. So based on uh, the comments from the yeah. council. Just so to make sure that, that there's no, there's no, uh, there's no, dis there's no disagreement about what the findings were. We'll put down what we've heard tonight, and you can review okay. them and agree okay. to them. So we're not. For that we're not done yet. But no. So that was the first motion. The second, you'll have to uh, now make a motion on the practical difficulty definition. So, uh, based on council's suggestion of the practical difficulty not uh, being all of the items that we've encompassed and then putting it together for us and bring it back for a final sign-off, that I'd move that we accept the fact that the, as previously our previous position, this property meets the standard of. Uh, actually exceeds the standard of practical difficulty requirement. That one. And let me clarify just because we were asked to specifically by the court, and that's for both additions. That's the right. front and the, the side. The entire property, both additions, uh, yes. Based on based on the discussion you've had tonight. Based all the on, findings based on all the findings okay. yeah. that we all the findings of fact and the discussion we've had. Do you need that motion more defined? No. Do I have a second by second? Discussion on that motion? Say no all in favor? That's also unanimous, thank you. Then we, uh, we need to reaffirm the, uh, the one through seven. However, I, I do think something does need to be clarified. I think, again, Mr. McCall brought up a good question. Um, 
when they raised the property up and posted it, did that trigger an incident or a, a issue that was caused by the, the appellant? In what way? I'm not saying one way or another. I'm okay. just saying that he brought it up. I think it's a fair question. He brought up the question of, uh, you know, he didn't mention it. He didn't mention it that way, but I think you have to look at it that way. Did that activity trigger the problem that we are now trying to fix? Mr. Longstaff? You mean raising the house and putting a right. foundation? I mean, I don't think we've seen no. any evidence. I don't believe it has either. I think yeah. we have to honestly talk about it. Yeah, that. I just have a question for Mr. Longstaff. They wouldn't have had to come before us to raise it, right? Or would they have? Or would they just got a building permit from you? If if their um, installation of a new foundation did not um, raise the uh, height of the building by more than a foot, we do allow a foot of difference only in ca in the cases where somebody had to reframe it using larger framing. It could, you know, they're not adding space inside. They're just yep. bringing it up. If they were to elevate it and add four feet, that would have been um, an expansion vertically of a nonconforming building. If, if they were to raise it one foot, one inch, that would have required a variance. I'm assuming, and I have not examined that particular issue, uh, I'm assuming that it, they were issued a permit by the town in, the, in order to do that foundation. I'm assuming that they, as he said, elevated the structure, installed the new foundation, dropped the structure back down on it, and there was no elevation of the of the nonconforming part of the structure. Thank you. So there was no require. You can do that without a variance. You can do that with a building permit. In the shoreland zone, you would have to prove that you've moved the, the building to the greatest practical extent from the resource. They're not in the shoreland zone. There's no requirement for them to do anything with that building. Any. I don't know, Mr. Lynch, you want to take the podium again? Are you in, I mean, um, that Mr. Longstaff said you didn't move it up more than um, a foot? Well, I know the physical um, condition is we didn't add hardly any additional height. Um, you, you, the basement is, so-called basement, is unusable. You can't stand up in it. I believe, I'm 90% certain we did it meeting that one foot max because I remember we put a mark on a tree and the enforcement officer came over and was making sure we didn't. Uh, so I'm 90% sure that's how it how it happened. Did you disconnect the utilities when you made that move? I don't know. Okay. I don't, I, My thought being if they disconnected the utilities, they could have raised or lowered, but if they kept the utilities connected, that might be proof that they didn't move elevation significantly. Well, I, I think I they would have remember had. that, but yeah, it's it's not. It didn't add usable space. It just gave us a sound footing. Okay. And right. and I, I think my comments on this would be, the applicants already told us that <laughs> you have piers and pilings underneath there every year. The house moved. All they were trying to do was really stabilize it. They didn't try to encroach anymore. They didn't try to go anyplace else. They just tried to pick it up, solidify the house, and put it back down. So you're saying that that action did not precipitate the current situation? I do not believe so, no. The, the, the same items are still there. Does anybody Doing that anything? didn't change any of the items. It didn't change the electrical. It didn't change the hallways. It didn't change the height of whatever the wagon was or whatever in there. It didn't change any of that stuff. It just made the house more solidified so that it wasn't going to move every winter so that it, they weren't going to come and find it knocked down on one side when they came back in the summertime. Does anybody disagree with Mr. Crockett's analysis? I agree. Right. So what I'd like to do is at this point, I think we can wrap up the last piece is reaffirming the seven items. I'd like to read them in. Okay. And I've, I think we've all had a chance to read the minutes. I've watched the tape. I think unless you see something that's different today, or well, two new members see something different. I think we're reaffirming the old information. And again, but clarifying that there, there are still additions, still additions or if you have something different for one of the additions over the right. other. Make that clear when you make your motion. Okay. okay. So uh, this is just, again, I'm moving this with the, uh, the seven items that were previously uh, approved and walked through. All that information, uh, I believe, is still current. We're, we're reaffirming that and allowing the board to adjust if necessary a different thoughts so we can make sure that those seven are met currently. 
and there's no question as to whether or not the board is sticking to its position. Is that fair? Well, if you're going to, why don't you not make the motion then? Because why don't you read them into the record? Exactly. If someone has something adi additional to add, you'll add them, and then the motion will be to um, readopt them with the additional findings. Yeah, I just okay. want to make sure that the, you don't, I don't want to, the, the motion to move, okay. if you will, as we go through the, the addition. So, so we don't have anything so additional If you add. want to read them in, so I'm just going to them. read them through, yeah. and if anybody wants to add anything or subtract anything, that because they, they made it, as again, it's brought up, you can do that. It, it's a legitimate question. I want to either acknowledge that or eliminate it. Okay. So the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and, the gen and not the general conditions in the neighborhood. I believe that that was met previously, and I can I've reaffirm that position. Anybody have any different thoughts? I agree. Yeah. The front of the property narrows down significantly at the very entrance to the property, and then it widens out for a very short period before becoming a very short building envelope towards the back end of the property. Okay. And I think that is unique to this property. Okay. So, so that's something you would add? That's, a, that's added. Why don't you read the finding okay. uh, that you made <coughs> and then decide if you need to add to it. Let me I read it, Mark. I'll get this yes, one. Yes, sure. The irregular shape of the property, the larger front yard set back to the building, and the unusual framing conditions of the building create a unique circumstance and therefore a need for the variance. It would be unreasonable to try and pick up and move the 150-year-old structure that probably would not survive the move. However, it could withstand remodeling and being brought up to code. So anybody have anything to add to that? I think my comment about the shape of the building envelope at the front and uh, being very, uh, it, as it widens out, not being very deep, okay. precludes and uh, doesn't allow this. Yeah, I don't think we addressed that originally. Yeah. So all in favor of number one being that again, reaffirming number one. Reaffirming, reaffirming it with the, with the additional with the additional finding that the, the building area. envelope narrows in the, uh, in the front. Okay. All in favor? That's unanimous on that. Go ahead and turn to number two. Uh, granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in character of the neighborhood, will not have unreasonable detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting properties. Uh, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. The proposed building will not have a detrimental effect on the use of the fair or fair market value of abutting properties. The proposed alterations and additions will also sub be subject to an administrative review to determine the compliance with the Higgins Beach Character Code before issuance of construction permit. Anybody have anything to add beyond that? I, I think I, the discussion that we had, oh, go ahead, Mark. No, I'm just going to move that we reaffirm number two as was originally written. And I think the review done by the town helped reaffirm that, that this is being done within the accordance or the, the intent of the new core, uh, the new code. I've got a motion on there, but I can add that on there also. It's fine. Do I have a second? Okay. All in favor, number two has been met. It's unanimous. Number three, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. And the practical difficulty is a result of zoning ordinance restrictions that were passed after the building was constructed and prior to any lot lines. I believe that is consistent today as it was back then. I would move that we reaffirm that position. I think one thing that I didn't hear last time that I heard this time was the applicant brought up something about when the Higgins Beach was all divided. It was put into these lots that they were already sitting on and this was automatically put. I don't think we had that. Was the date 1898 or yeah, something like that? I don't think we had that information. Thank you. And so we might want to put that in there that that did contribute to this when Higgins Beach was all subdivided. Yeah. Anybody have a problem with adding that into the equation? I, I move with that with that addition that uh, we reaffirm uh, number three. Okay. Second. All there. Unanimous. Four. No other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. And written in is there is not any other feasible alternative to the applicants except a variance. The roof, electrical, plumbing, as well as the structure itself is two by four construction and not insulated. And I don't think we had that. What I asked the applicant today, it has knob and tube wiring and doesn't have a full centralized heat source either. Okay, but just, a, just a clarification on those. No other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. I think the applicants also reviewed today the ability of moving the building and how it would have affected them. 
I think they went over that in detail, and I think that was an alternative that was considered and was not uh, followed up on, as well as looking at the staircase and trying to go wider in the existing spot couldn't be done. So then they had to look within the building, and it became clear that that was not the best alternative also. Anybody have anything? Nope. So I'd reaffirm uh, number four uh, with the uh, comments by uh, both Mr. Crockett and uh, Mr. Lazell. Uh, second? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. And then the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. The granting of the variance request will allow the owner the ability to install code compliant stairways, code compliant windows, create improvements to the interior space of the house, such as bathrooms, laundry area, traffic flow through the existing area, as well as proposed addition. The proposal will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties by making more code compliant. Okay, and uh, I would add that, um, in Richard, with the more information, I would add that the um, new standards, right, new standards really, really had a lot to do with that. that. And again, it comes back to it. So with that comment, I move that we reaffirm that number. Number five? Number five. Number five. Number five. Do I have a second? Yes. Any discussion? All in favor? Number six, the granting of the variance will not have an unreasonable adverse effect on the natural environment. The granting of the variance will not have unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. I just move that uh, we reaffirm number six. I think there's anything more to add. Do right. so I have a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And it's not in the flood zone. Uh, and no, no, it is not. And then the eventual standards, those provisions of the ordinance which relate to a lot area, lot coverage, frontage, and setback, including the buffer requirements, and then the practical difficulty, which, you've already which we've already yeah. answered yet. Yeah. So I'd like to take so the one final, final thing is the decision. Yeah. I'd like to take one final vote on the entire package. Yeah. That we are reaffirming our position from September of 2016 and uh, augmenting it with the information uh, provided. A second on that? A second. Discussion on that motion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Okay, thank you. So is there anything else that we should be doing? I think I have it. So we'll we'll draft up your draft findings based on your votes and your discussion tonight, and bring it and bring you back a form for you to review at your next meeting. Okay, so we've covered. You had a motion on the, the 38 foot limit. You had a, um, a motion on practical difficulty definition, um, and you had a motion reaffirming and adding to your prior findings. And both of those last two motions, you you uh, clarified that they applied to both editions. Correct. And you didn't have anything that that was different for each edition. It was it was a general finding for each of those editions, and we yes, I have and that. Why don't I want me to reaffirm that, or does that stay as well? I got it in both motions, but you, you okay. Good. No, it's, well, I'll put I, it. I'll put it in the motion as I've drafted it, and you okay. can uh, if, when you review it to make sure that it's okay at the next meeting. Do we need to address anything for B1, or did we already do that with the dimensional standards? Dimension. Yeah, I just. To know that's if we needed really to do anything more with statement. That's, that's a definition of this lets you know what a dimensional standard is. Oh, I what? didn't know if no. we needed to do anything no. No. Okay. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, that moves this motion that we're we'll closing up. Uh, finally, we'll start with the next. Uh, do you want to take a five minute break? 9 30. We've got a three minute break. So 9 30, we'll start again. So we're on uh, recess till 9 30.
Notice how I said Mr. Wilson failed me? <laughs> yes. As long as I was on the record for that. You were. He failed me. <laughs> hey, what's with the insurance lesson? I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Remember, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your friends. <laughs> yeah, I know. Believe me, I found that out. Big shows. Okay, everybody sat. We all sit out in back there. We wake them up. Looks like we're on. I think we're on. I think we're on. Okay. Well, welcome back. Or doing it live. We're back. So I start the meeting again. We've got the appeal number 2605, which we had switched out. It's a hardship variance request by the Bruette family. Uh, uh, Bruette. I want to make sure I pronounce it properly. Family Cottage LLC, 4 Champions Street. This is map U1, parcel 86. Mr. Wilson. Oh. Yes, good evening. Walter Wilson from Design Company again. Um, I have been sitting here for the last hour and a half trying to think how I can make this presentation as quick as possible. I've come up to the conclusion it may not be very quick. <laughs> Um, one of the things I would like to say is the plans presented to the board with the house has received the administrative review from the town for compliance with the character code of the ordinance. Um, and of course it does say we may need to come in for a variance, but we have met that requirement. Um, and that was dated actually April 26th. Um, a general review of what we're planning on doing here before I get into the variance itself is just an overall, trying to cut down some time instead of spelling out everything. The existing property has a house on it. It is in the within the 75-foot set, setback from the beach. It's at the end of Champion Street and abuts the ocean with a seawall bisecting the lot. The existing house does not meet any of the existing code requirements that have to be met. Um, relating to uh, erosion hazard area, flood zone, uh, character of compliance with the t uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, it's in three or four other overlay districts of the DEP. And the plans that we drew up and we presented to the town for approval reflect all those things that make tw to make this building, this new building that's going to go on, the replacement of this building, to go on as compliant with these codes. Now. The question comes up um, in reviewing this is that it get kicked into this full variance because of the location, for one. And then under the definition of um, what requires the variance is under Section 12, I believe, in the ordinance. Uh, where a non-conforming building or structure is demolished. This is Section 12, Paragraph 3 of the uh, Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. 
If a non-conforming building or structure is demolished or removed by its owner, it shall not be rebuilt or replaced except in conformity with the requirements of Section 15B of the ordinance unless a grant variance is granted for such requirements by the zoning board. Well, the zoning board isn't automatically triggered unless you don't meet 15B. If you meet 15B, you could rebuild it the way I read the ordinance. Now, the question in 15B basically triggers two things that respect to this property. One is that the, uh, it says all new principal and accessory structures shall be set back from the normal high water line, uh, whatever the distance is, in an Shoreland overlay, it is 75 feet from the resource. Of course, the existing building, I think, is like 22 feet. The other thing is triggered in here is the total lot coverage uh, in the Sherland over the district, uh, the property located within the CDCR1, which is the Higgins Beach character ordinance, uh, not exceed 35 percent. Well, the house is unique in that it has like 93 percent coverage on the lot now when you include the house and the whole lot is paved except for one section in the back. And that, that means that the impervious area is already 93%. So the impervious area, by rule of being there prior to zoning change and stuff, is grandfathered. So the lot coverage is a grandfathered issue. That means that we are left with one thing. And that would be the 75 foot setback. Now, I, I had, had a big spiel I was going to do on this whole thing. I'm going to try to cut it as short as I can. Um, the Shoreline is owning on it on the Chapter 405C, Section 12. It does allow new construction to take place within the 75-foot setback with restrictions. Um, a non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded um, if such additional expansion does not increase the non-conformity or uh, of the um, of the property. And it says an existing structure may be expanded in floor area and volume up to 30 percent. It also says in Section C1C, no structure which is less than the required setback from the resource may be expanded towards that setback. And C2 says a non-conforming structure may be relocated on the property, provided that it conforms to all the setbacks to the greatest extent possible. Now, these new constructions that they talk about are actually based on an existing structure be there and their, and their additions and improvements to the existing structure. <clears throat> so there is construction that's allowed within the 75 feet. It's not just a no, you can't do it. Um, now, like I said, if, a, if it's the non-conforming structure is demolished or removed by owner, it has to meet what's in 15B. Um, This lot, from the seawall to the back of the lot, is 73 feet. So the whole structure's within the whole lot's within the 75-foot setback. Um, and like I said, it's already already uh, impervious with 93 percent of the property. I'm trying to skip a few things here. Pardon me. I don't know. Now, I previously said about <coughs> construction taking place within the 75 foot. The ordinance does allow for some of that structure, uh, construction, and that they all require work done on an existing structure. Now, so all those categories I talked about, an, an expansion, um, a relocation or a reconstruction of a house in the 75 feet, um, that stuff's allowed within the 75-foot setback. And all those ca uh, categories apply to properties that have been previously used with a principal residence building within the 75-foot setback. Now, this is what I'm getting at. The request before you in the 75-foot setback covers the entire property. And the request is for a replacement of an existing structure, which does not and cannot economically be improved to conform to these statutes. So 
so that's why we need a new building. The ordinance in section 15 states, 15B states, all new principal structures must be set back for 75 feet. The request is in front of you is to replace an existing structure. It is not to build a new structure on a previously undeveloped parcel of land. That would be a new structure located where no other existing structure existed before. Now the ordinance allows permission to do all kinds of structures, construction on existing houses. So when the ordinance says all new structures, principal structures must be set back. To me that is saying that when they say no construction allowed in 75 foot setback, and the ordinance does allow all this work to take place on existing structures. When they say all new principal structures must be set back 75 feet, I'm interpreting that as being a vacant lot and you've got to put a house on it, you've got to be back 75 feet from, from the ocean. I'm thinking in replacing an existing structure, which is closer than the 75 feet, should be allowed under the ordinance and under 15B. Now, the proposal before you will allow the owner to meet all the regulations imposed on the property, such as the FEMA flood, the EHA requirements, the front dune regulations, as well as the character ordinance uh, in the shoreland zone. And here's where I'm getting into the question as to we've, do we even need a variance. And I'll I'm again, trying to make this real shot. <clears throat> it says in the CDCR1 district, which is Higgins Beach character, the setbacks for a residential building are 18 feet, minimum primarily front setback, 8 foot on sides, and 30 foot on the rear property lines. Now, if you look at this piece of property, it has a little bit of frontage on Champion Street that comes down the, the right side of the property for about 40 feet or so. I gotta stop you for a second, sir. And then Champion Street oh, stops. I gotta stop you for a second. The, the, we're not here with a, with a uh, request for an administrative appeal. We're here for a variance appeal. Yes. So, if we're going to go into administrative appeal, it's a different process. Well, I'm so just wondering if it even applies that we need it, a variance. It does because we're here, and it's a variance appeal. So we okay. can't really. Go, so we need to just so stick I'll, to the variance appeal. Okay. So okay. Need, uh, this, what I have to say is part of that variance okay. appeal. On the character ordinance, you're allowed multiple frontages at Higgins Beach. This has a frontage on Champion Street, and it has a frontage on the ocean, which is a secondary frontage. So there's two frontages on this lot. The, like I said about the setbacks, what we have to, the character ordinance says, about the 18 foot in the front, 18 foot on the side. Well, this property is, is described in the ordinance as having both a primary frontage, uh, primary front setback as well as a secondary front, uh, front setback, that being the beach. This is classified in the ordinance as a beachfront garage court lot because it has frontage on the beach and the street. And this means that the property, by its location, has two frontages. In Article 4, Section A4 of the CDCR1 ordinance, it states that all the buildings must be located behind the minimum front side and rear setback, except as stated in Article 4A5. And I'd like to read 4A5 to you. 4A5 guys the setback encroachment. And before I read this, I want to specify one thing. The Shoreline Ordinance District under the Shoreline Ordinance is part of the ordinance in the Shoreline District. It's part of, part of the regular ordinance. If it, uh, the Shoreline Ordinance District overlay and, and streams and so forth, that governs. But in the Shoreline District, the Shoreline Overlay District is part of the main ordinance, which means that the parts of the main ordinance comply to that. And <coughs> it says here in the setback encroachments in 4A5, 
It says, notwithstanding the general yard requirements applicable to other districts within the ordinance, building frontages and components within the character districts may extend beyond a required front side or rear setback as indi indicated for each type, provided that at least three feet is maintained in a vertical plane from the side and rear lot lines. <coughs> now, that uh, says that all building frontages may extend beyond the re required setbacks. <coughs> and I'm saying that the frontage setback that the Shore Lane Overlay District sets up for 75 feet from the shoreline is a frontage setback because it says you have to be 75 feet from the, from the ocean. That creates a setback and a frontage on the beach side, which is on one of the frontages on this property. Um, and this is all comes about because it says in the ordinance, if you comply to 15B, you don't need to come for a variance. And I'm saying the ordinance, the way I interpret it, allows the building frontage to be encroached on the setback, including the 75-foot setback from the beach, because that is also a beach frontage. Now, if you notice in there, it doesn't say how much the encroachments can be. That's because on something like this, the encroachment is already established. The ordinance says that no building can be building, built to, added to, or improved that creates a point where you're closer to the resource than what already exists. So in this case, I'm saying that the encroachment can be allowed up to the front of the existing building, which is what we're proposing. Now, to go along with that, in the letter that you have from the um, DEP in the first letter from DEP. Um, it says the applicant states that the reconstructed structure would be located six feet further back from the shoreline than the existing structure and a new six foot wide deck would be constructed within that area. Then of course they say it's highly inconsistent with the state requirement to relocate a non-conforming structure to make room for the deck. But outside the scope of a variance request, the department would not take issue with the proposed new structure in the, location, in the new location six feet further back from the shoreline. So the DEP is saying that they don't see that the location we're proposing is a problem. The problem comes in seeking a variance where they say that they have some problems in us trying to meet the uh, reasonable return part. And my approach right now is first to find out if the section of the ordinance says that uh, the frontages can be encroached upon. And with the beach being classified as a frontage to this property, are we allowed under the ordinance, that you guys oversee, to locate that building where it is shown on the plan without a variance because the ordinance says unless we have to come to the board, we have to show that a variance is needed. And that's where I'm at. Again, I'll go back to it. If you want to challenge the, this is a different appeal. If you want to, if you want to challenge the decision that this is a, needs a variance appeal, that's a different appeal than what we've got here. So if we're going to go down that path, we need to just table it and go down the okay. appeal. I am willing to proceed with the variance, but I thought I'd bring that up to the board and mention it in the uh, review because I believe, in my own opinion, that a variance is not needed. It's, it's not our call. The call was made. You can appeal right. the call to us, but the call has been made. So that's the problem. It's not a matter. I don't know whether you, I agree or disagree with you. It's irrelevant. That call has been made. You can disagree with the call, and, and right. there's an appropriate process for that. Okay. But we've got a variance appeal. So that's why. I mean, it's just. Yep. I, un I understand that. Um, I just wanted to bring it to the board's attention before I went further with this. Um, but we can go through the variance, and we can, uh, I can give my reasons why we think the variance should be approved even without that. Okay. That'd be perfect. Oversight. 
No, it's pretty pretty clear. Um, it, this is a standard hardship variance. It is very clear that a variance by our ordinance is required for a replacement of a structure. That's what they're proposing is to replace the structure. It's not an expansion, it's not a reconstruction, it's a replacement. Um, and so here we are. The, the four criteria are, you've been through them before, that's what the board needs to find. And, you know, the, the comments by DEP, again, to clarify, I know Mr. Um, uh, Wilson took issue with this. Not my fault. The ordinance says that we have to send this to DEP. DEP's comments have to be considered by the board. They're not telling the board what to do. They're not telling the board what decision to make. But they must be considered because that's what the law says. Okay? And I'm, I'm not saying that the comments uh, by Mike Morse from the DEP are absolute, in, in, or, and I'm not saying they aren't. Um, that's up to you. That's your job, not mine. But I believe it's pretty clear. So I'll leave it there and let you guys do what you need to do. Um, you mentioned that it, was, it looks like they're, you're looking for, they're looking for an expansion, not a replacement on the same spot. The, they're rebuilt. They're tearing down the structure and replacing it. It's a new structure. But it looks like they're taking more space. They are taking slightly more space. All right. and, and, and that's fine. That's what they're asking for. That's the appeal. Um, and just they're, they're moving the building back and they're putting, a, they're putting a, a porch on the front. And one of the reasons the porch is on there, or the, the deck rather, I guess it's a deck, right. not a porch, I'm, excuse me is because they need that access to those entrances when they elevate the structure. They, they now have created a need for a new structure. The debate that you folks must, you know, satisfy yourselves with that the applicant has demonstrated is why that is absolutely needed on that side of the building. Why, why there couldn't be a different design that would allow that access on the side of the building, for example. I'm not saying that it should or shouldn't. I'm not saying, but that's your job. Um, you know, somebody saying something is one thing, demonstrating it is another. And that's what I caution, I think that's kind of what we just went through in the other appeal, is you need to make sure that you're satisfied they have demonstrated, not just said, not just said this is what we want and this is how it, demonstrate it. Give us some numbers, give us some proof. That's what you guys need and that's where we are. Okay. So, if you'd like to continue this I can address the deck issue first, sure. if you want. Uh, when you reconstruct, build a new, or raise an existing building up, under Article 4, in, let me see what section it um, has to do with the um, uh, D. Um, Article 4, D, Section 19, um, it deals with pilings under foundations that are four to eight feet high. And it, in that picture itself, for the for the building, it shows the front deck going across the house. Um, now, if you look at front deck under Article 4 AD, it shows a front porch along the side of a house. But it says on here, decks may only encroach into the side and rear setbacks with the exceptions of houses elevated more than six feet on pilings or pier in the coastal overlay zone, in which case a deck may be used in lieu of a porch, provided it's similarly elevated. Now what that means, on the frontage of a house, the ordinance requires a porch to be put on the front of a house. Okay? Um, that is the requirement of what you see on many of the houses with the front porch in the house. That goes on the front of the house. Well, this house has two frontages. One is the beach. And in the, in the beachfront carriage court, garage court, the house can face the beach and have the frontage on the beach. So the deck that's shown on the plan is elevated up the same as the house. It's allowed to take the place of a porch, and it can be on the front of the house. So the location of that porch on the plans that we're showing is what the character district says you can do. So that part of the porch location and size 
is directed through the ordinance to get to that point. And when it went through character review from the administration, it was given the approval to be there. So that takes care of the porch. Um, so I guess the first question is we need to get to the decision as to whether or not you meet the standard of having to tear the building down. What, what is driving the fact that we need to replace this building? Because that's ultimately, you're talking about tearing something down and replacing it, correct? Right. So I got I'm the assuming that's really is what we're talking about, at least initially. I can read the, my written response that I gave you if you would like. So why don't we, why don't we go way down through these if everybody's okay with that? Mm -hmm. Uh, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Are we on the criteria already? <laughs> Jumping ahead of my speech. <laughs> Let me see, where are we here? Where are we? So you asked me a question? Pardon? Do you ask me a question? Yeah, let's, do, let's just jump right into the, um, we, we've, got to, we've got to establish whether or not it meets the threshold of requiring the building to be torn down, because ultimately right. that gives us, without that, we're, we're not even going to be here. So okay, so it? you want me to read my answers that I gave sure, the, the describing the project and why a variance is needed? Yes, the land of variance uh, question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. So we've got a house there that's there now, right? Well, that's jumping ahead to the variance appeal question. That's with the variance appeal, doing. right? Variance yeah, appeal. I thought you wanted to hear why the vari why I say that variance is needed and what, why the project needs a variance. We know it needs a variance. We just okay. we've already established that the only alternative is to go back and say you want an administrative okay. appeal. I'll jump forward then. <laughs> okay. Uh, question one. In order to protect a residential building and the use on the property from flood elevation, both current and future, the structure needs to be elevated and supported by pilings. The existing structure was not intended to be supporting with this type of foundation due to the framing in the existing cottage, and trying to utilize it on the site would be futile at best. In order to comply with the regulations imposed on the property by the DEP overlay districts, a new building meeting these restrictions is proposed. If the variance is not granted, the property would not meet the erosion hazard area requirements, would not meet the flood zone requirements, would not be in compliance with the Town of Scarborough character-based ordinance, and would create a possible danger to abutting properties if it was destroyed by flood or wave action. In order to maintain a long-established residential use on the land and protect the structure from flooding and also comply with the regulations and requirements that have been placed on the property, the land in question cannot use, yield a reasonable return without granting a variance. Okay, and the uh, need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. The need for a variance is due to several factors. The property is bisected by a seawall that reduces the land area to the existing grandfathered size of 50 foot by 73 foot. The property is located within the 75 foot setback from the resource of the Atlantic Ocean. The town of Scarborough imposes building setbacks to cover most of the property. The property orientation to Champion Street is not consistent with the other properties in the area. And due to the DEP overlay districts, the improvements to the property are needed in order to comply, create a unique circumstance that is uncommon conditions not shared, shared by many of the Higgins Beach neighborhood. In order to comply with these unique circumstances, a variance is needed. And the, um Granting the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. The granting of the requested variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. The plans have been reviewed by the town administration review for compliance with the Higgins Beach character-based ordinance and has been approved for building size, height, location, and design. Okay. So, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Four. 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 Sorry. Uh, the hardship is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I'm sorry. The hardship is not a result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner of the property. The hardship is the, is, the, is the applicant's desire to comply with the regulations and requirements that have been placed on the property by the Town of Scarborough and the zoning ordinance in various applicable DEP overlay districts, the FEMA floodplain, the erosion hazard area designation. The property was <coughs> developed for residential use before any of these districts were impo uh, districts uh, uh, imposed um, were imposed on the property. Now, I would like to say that those are the reasons I think we need a variance coupled with the fact that all the houses down in this section of town and along the other sections in the town are going to have to do what this applicant is requesting. The state's going to require it. The federal government's going to require it. Here's, okay. here's the problem with that, and I need to be, this is one of the concerns I had. Yeah. Need to and be most of these houses cannot take and be raised up and kept because they aren't built to be put on pilings. And it's a thing we're going to have. Now, to that, I would like to look at your staff notes and what uh, was said in the staff notes, the most recent one. Um, this talks about the ordinance um, where it says the board of the Scarborough zoning ordinance is more restrictive than the state. The state has no problem with doing this because the state guidelines say that if structure is removed, damaged, or destroyed, regardless of cause, by more than 50%. It can be reconstructed if a permit is obtained within 18 months. And the placement structure must meet the resource setback to the greatest extent possible as determined by the planning board. In other words, the state doesn't have the restriction that the town of Scarborough does. And as it goes on, it says, the staff has provided this comparison for informational purposes. The governing re regulations in the case is the town ordinance, not the state guidelines. However, the board should note that the staff does intend to propose a zoning, shoreline zoning update that would more closely resemble the state guidelines. So we are in a situation like the last one, where what we have proposed meets the, the state DEP situation. And the ordinance that we have is creating a hardship for redoing it unless we get a variance to do such a thing, which the state allows. Um, do we have any letters or calls on this? Uh, no. I couldn't see anything. No. All right, when I open the public, anybody wish to speak on this issue from the public? Anybody wish to speak on this? Seeing that, I'll close the public section. I would like to make one comment before go we go any further. Yep. If in your deliberations you think that the the variance that we're applying for may require more information from you because I did rush this a little bit tonight and we jumped through it. Uh, I'd be willing to either give it to you tonight or we could do another meeting at another time. But anyway, I hope you can go through it this evening. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you put that on the table. It helps. So here's, here's my concerns. Um, we haven't established at all whether or not the building is sound or not sound. So to me, it comes down to being the, the state's regulations that are being placed on this have nothing to do with whether or not the house is sound. The state's not making them do anything. They're not saying you can't occupy that property unless you raise that. They're not saying that. They're just putting new, they're putting new requirements on. They they may want to be proact proactive in meeting those, but that's their call, and I respect that. I mean, I actually have a lot of respect for that. But I don't see how that is the reason for us needing to bring this to the board for a variance. I don't, I don't think that unless we can establish that the property can't bring value. I would argue that, yeah, if you can prove that the house is in a situation where it just needs to be, it's, it's in trouble and you've got to replace it, fine. I think we can then have that discussion. But if we're not establishing 
that we're only saying right now, all I'm hearing right now is that this is about the state's mandates and, and the new regulations of FEMA. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with anything we deal with. So can, can we hear the appellant address that, please? Sure. Well, that was what I was going to read before you jumped into the thing, is to describe the project and why a variance Perfect. was needed. Before I jump, go ahead. Okay. No problem. I just want to get out there so you know where I'm coming from. And, and, and let me, I'll give you a heads up on another one, just so you know. Okay. The need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general conditions of the neighborhood. What that's about is, if in fact there's a big problem in the neighborhood, it needs to be addressed through ordinance as opposed to variance. So if you're telling me there's a whole bunch of homes that are going to be affected by this, it doesn't belong here. It belongs to the ordinance committee. So it's either, it's either a specific issue by itself that's not related, or it's in fact a global issue, and, and so I guess we've got to define which one that is. Uh, yeah, I, I tried to stop you on that part, but uh, go ahead. You know, we did a, uh, a variance last year on one of those houses right along there. I don't remember, I mean, did it need That's it? Cool. Yeah. I, I don't remember the property, was it? it was I came to the board before under the same situation. It was a house about three houses down. I, I don't remember it, and I don't know whether or not it had anything to do with the start. I'm coming back to my concern is we need to establish that the home has no useful useful life left to me. To go fast. I mean, you might disagree with that. Please in, in respond, and, and feel free to jump in. Okay. Um, I'll read what I my, my explanation on that. Uh, it may not be inclusive enough for you, but I'll read it anyway. The existing cottage measures 28 by 4 inches by 35 foot 4 inches as a concrete block foundation with a crawl space. The roof is a gable frame with approximately a 612 pitch. The interior first floor plan contains a living room, a kitchen, bathroom, and four bedrooms. The stairway leads up to an open loft family area with a half bath. The property extends down to the low water mark and bisected by the seawall. The existing cottage is also loaded, located in the erosion hazard zone, and a home in this location may be increased up to 30%, like we said before, and the foundation elevated. Um, the existing floodplain level requires the first floor to be one foot above the minimum floodplain level. And in the erosion hazard zone, it's required to have a minimum three-foot clearance from the grade to the bottom of the house. They call it the freeze board. These requirements result in a first floor elevation minimum height of 16.2. The existing height on first floor is 12.9. The flood levels are soon to be raised and may increase to the 16-foot level, and that will require a finished floor in this house to be at 19 feet and we're proposing it to be at 19 foot one and a half inches. The existing cottage was built to sit on a concrete block foundation. The exterior walls are two by four with limited insulation. The roof is constructed with two by six rafters, probably 24 inches on center. They might be more than that. The second floor joists are two by six rafters with 24 inch on centers. The roof framing does not have seal and cross ties as required by code. And the stairs up to the second floor are uh, non-code non compliant. The plumbing and electrical systems need updating to be code compliant, although the electrical is not the old knob and tube. The heating system is just a monitor type unit in the living room, and there's no central heat heating in the house. The bedroom windows on the second floor area are small and do not meet the egress code and the height of the walls is such that you cannot get an egress window up there. The existing cottage contains several non-compliant building code areas. The existing building does not meet the requirements of the character-based uh, zoning of the Higgins Beach in building shape, roof pitch, and fenestration. The exterior does not meet the required building components that the code requires as previously explained. Um, and of course it doesn't mean any of the DEP overlays. Even more important is the condition of the structure itself. The structure was intended, like I said, to sit on the concrete foundation and not be elevated and placed on pilings. The existing structure would need to be raised, moved off the site in order to install the new pilings. 
The cottage would then have to be brought back in to sit onto the new pilings. This would require substantial reframing of the first floor system and the first floor exterior walls of the building. And needless to say, we have the problem of where you go to store the cottage once it's <laughs> raised up and moved. The roof system on the second floor, Joyce, would then have to be removed off the cottage after it's brought back. And the finance cost of doing this would probably exceed the, well exceed the value of the existing building. And in order to comply with the requirements set forth in the erosion hazard zone, and the V zone, and the flood zone, and the shore lane zone, and, and all the other zones involved on this, <laughs> uh, the owner is proposing to build a new cottage on a piling, on the pilings to take the place of this cottage that cannot be, like I said before, brought up to date, brought up to code, and in no way economically reused to meet these requirements. And if a variance is not granted, the existing cottage will remain as is, and the rising flood level in future storms will eventually take its toll and uh, may cause damage to the neighborhood. Now, one of the things that it says here about the definition per uh, variance, a variance is a relaxation of terms of the ordinance which such variance would not be contrary to public interest and where owing to conditions peculiar to the property and not to the results of action by the op 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 applicant, the little enforcement of the ordinance would result in an undue hardship. And I'm saying <coughs> that the conditions that are peculiar to this are not only lot size and location, it's all the overlays that go with it and all the restrictions we have to have to comply to the new ordinances that are being placed on this property. And the new and the existing structure cannot feasibly, even economically or feasibly, be utilized to meet these restrictions. Now, and the result of, of this is not of actions taken by the applicant, it's by all the government officials that imposed all these frictions on the applicant and he's trying to comply and make it a legitimate um, constructed building. And in doing so, it complies with the character ordinance. We have approval from them for the building design. And there is another little thing under the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. Section 12A1 under the purpose. It is the intent of this ordinance to promote land use conformities, except that non conforming conditions can further be uh, used. Except as otherwise provided in this ordinance, a non conforming condition shall not be permitted to become more non conforming. Now I'm saying by leaving that house there and not recognizing all the state overlays, it is allowing the house to become more non-conforming because of all the restrictions that are being put onto it. And if he doesn't get the variance to do what the proposal says, the property will, will always be more non-conforming and the town will be allowing that to happen. So I think that the variance that we're asking for is not only a legitimate variance, I think it's a proper variance and I think it meets the character, uh, the, uh, the definition spelled out in the ordinance for such a variance in this case. And I think hardship is met primarily because the condition of the house, you cannot raise it, and the overlay districts that are being placed on the property are making this property more non-conforming all the time. Okay. Um, question from the board? Yeah. I'm, I'm struggling with kind of the same thing you were. You just went over all the shoreland and all the other regulations and things that are going on in the neighborhood. Yeah. You're, you're kind of making the case against this. Well, I'm not making a case, case against it because the town hasn't addressed it. And so when an individual wants to do something on his property, he has to come in and ask for the variances and so forth that, that are in place. I mean, if the town wants to address it and take care of it so you haven't come in for a variance, that's great, but the town hasn't done it, and we're here on a one-by-one -one individual application coming before the board. Um, uh, like Ed said, I came in before on the board and just down the house from here a few couple, three years ago, and we got the variance 
to destroy the building, take it down, tear it up, put pilings on, and raise the house up and construct a new building under the same situation. Uh, if it's again, I, I don't want to get in. We don't. We don't. Number one, we don't go by precedent, so I, I really don't want to go there. Number two, I don't have any idea what the condition of the house was. I, and I don't. That might have happened, Mark, on a time when you weren't here. But, but even so, much, it, yeah. it's, we don't have precedent. We don't go by precedent. We go by the, what we have in front of us and the presentations each time. So. I'm not trying to be difficult, but at the same time, I'm trying to be straight. And what, what I see, and I'll be candid, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be a jerk, I'm really not, but I just don't see this even coming close to giving us enough information to say this property is in such a condition that it needs to be replaced. If the, bar, if the, bar, if the uh, applicant wants to improve the property and bring it more in conformance, they can do that, but they can do it as it sits. There's, there's nothing that reaches the, the, the standard of it that I've heard, and and what whatever positions that the state has put on, and I think the, the one argument you could make and hasn't been made is, if they're going to do any work on this thing, does it trigger the 50% rule, and does that work? I don't know. I'm just throwing something out to try and help you a little bit, but that's the only thing I'm hearing right now is that someday somewhere we might get a flood and. Uh, to be candid with you, there's different views on that. So th I don't think that's enough of an argument. Uh, and yeah, the state's putting all kinds of regulations on most of those, and you're right, from the federal government. Most is to recover the losses they lost. So they're expanding it out. We know that. So but that has nothing to do with what, what, whether or not that property is useful, viable, meets the standard of a variance appeal, which is a pretty high standard. I, challenge, I need some thoughts from everybody else here. The existing building where it sits cannot be made compliant with any of those rules. Oh, that's probably true. Okay. Where well, it's it is. can't. And that existing building where it sits is designed to be on a block foundation with a three-foot crawl space. You just can't raise that up and put it on pilings. It doesn't work that way. You need a whole different structure on the carriage, and this house is not set up for it. So you can't raise it up. Explain that to me, please. Well, the floor joist system under the house, I believe it was two by sixes in some place and two by eights. They are designed for the framing members to come over and sit on a plate which sits on a foundation mm -hmm. wall. The carrying timber under the house is located from the front to the back down the middle of the house. Simple construction mm -hmm. for, a, for that. When you build it on pilings, you put the pilings up. You got to put top beams that go across the pilings. They have to be connected with metal brackets. The floor joist system then sit perpendicular to those. They all have to be connected with brackets for wind loads, shear loads, and all this other kind of engineering work that has to be done so that the thing doesn't sway. Okay. The floor joist system itself that goes in is 2 by 12s, and that's done to help the bracing effect of the house. On this house, you'd have to reconstruct the hole underneath of the house in order to put it on pilings uh, and to get it when done. When you say Correct. reconstruct the underside of the building, explain that to me. The floor joists and the carrying beam. They aren't designed to sit on top of support beams with pilings and be connected. In, so in such a way that you can right? brace the house. In their current arrangement. In the current arrangement. And you're saying that you couldn't oppose that direction and come up with a new system that supported that and carry the load of the building onto pilings. That's what I just heard you say. It's, I'm not going to say you can't possibly. It said in your, in your statement you said futile at best. Futile at best. Right. So To keep the structure the way it is. I want you have to change it. Because I don't believe so. I don't think that's an accurate statement. No. I think there are other support systems that could be put in that could accomplish that and get the, the bottom of the if building supported act well enough that you could put it on pilings. If and you're you assuming the pilings have to go directly under the building. That's another assumption you've made. Yes. That's an assumption. Yes, that's what the code requires, that all foundation must be under the building. Okay. Okay, that's in the code. 
The, there are other ways you could possibly do it. I agree. Diagonal bracing, steel beams, and so forth. Mm -hmm. but Angle piles? Possibly. Mm -hmm. yeah, that have to, that would, but that's not conventional method. That's going beyond convention. But it says futile at best. So yeah, if it's using futile, conventional me methods. Yeah. It would be. We have to look at all options, mm -hmm. right? And in this situation, I think you have to look further in your options because your building envelope on this particular postage stamp is non-existent. Yes, it is. It's and if you look at your building, your building envelope exceeds what you have for a building envelope right now. No. The building is less square footage in size. Footprint? Yes. Footprint of the building as defined by the code. Wait, wait, no, no, wait, wait. I don't want to hear as defined by the code. If I look at the footprint of the envelope of the building today, right, and the future building, right, is the future building, does it have a larger envelope? Smaller. Okay. The existing one's 1,001 square feet. Proposed will cover 952. What's your buildable envelope? Total square footage. That's it. Well, plus the porches and the stairs, which aren't counted in the lot coverage under the ordinance in the character zone. So you can't count those. Yeah, but you're going solely by the character zone, and I'm looking at a lot that is waterfront, that's in multiple different zones, and I'm saying, yeah, you got character, but this is a little different. The lot this coverage can't be different than what the zone calls for. An interpretation of lot coverage is based on the zone. I understand that. But you also look at impervious surfaces, pavement, right? Right. 93% 90, is impervious. I totally understand that. Yep. That's all you're, you're talking details around this particular ordinance. I get that. But I'm also looking at the DEP is saying they don't agree. Don't agree with what? I'll read it in the record. The, the department would not take issue with the proposed new structure house in the new location six feet further back from the shoreline, but the town could not permit the new deck. So they're saying the deck we could not permit. That's because they didn't read and understand the character ordinance and what's allowed for a deck. Which it, also, it also stated, through and is approved. as such, and this is later in the, the letter, it says, as such, the department notes that a variance for such a project can't legitimately be granted. So in their opinion, they don't think we should be granting this. And then down at the bottom of that statement, it also says, it's the department's position that the strict application of the terms of the ordinance would not result in undue hardship. As such, the department recommends the Board of Appeals deny the variance application on this basis. There simply is no legitimate conclusion otherwise. That's, that's, the Mike, that's Mike's opinion and he wrote. Yeah. I, I'd like to hear your opinion on why you would dis disagree with that. I disagree with it for some of the reasons that I've already stated and read tonight. I also disagree with it because he didn't take in consideration what those restraints were that were put on the property to understand why the variance is needed. His interpretation was based on just picking those four points up and saying, well, you can't meet this, you can't meet that. He did not have any input from our side. He did not listen to the, to the rebuttal that we give as to why we think we should do it. He just issued those on a blank statement after just reading the ordinance with no understanding of what we're trying to do, in my opinion. And therefore, he didn't base his conclusion that he put in the letter on the zoning board process of coming in and discussing all this, he just sat in his office and wrote what he thought was non-compliant. Well, well just, just one point of order. Um, he, he had your entire application mm -hmm. submittal, so he had all of your written explanations. Yes. So you can't say that he didn't have any of your arguments. He did have your arguments. He didn't have arguments that are presented to the board to do a thorough but he had all of your written comments, and, yes. th and they were pretty extensive. I just they want to were. clarify. I know. You're, you're misrepresenting he had, he what had. he had. I want to clarify for the board. Like I said. Not saying opinion. he's right or wrong, Walt. I'm just saying he had all of your application materials. Yes. He so had all the, all so the he had everything material. that the board has. The I only thing he didn't have was you. I don't know if you read them. That's the thing. Well, I have no conclusion on that. 
I, Mr. Chairman, he doesn't say I, in his letter that he did. He just said, based on his opinion, you can't meet those four standards. Right. I, I think we have to take the assumption that, that everybody here is professional, are professionals, and you can't. Uh, he's not going to just. I don't. I don't, I don't think you can go there. We're we're we're, we're spinning wheels. Yeah. So. And I, is, I don't. Is the, I really don't think that the DEP office has any uh, legitimate. Uh, um, legal authority to tell the board what the interpretation of a zoning ordinance is in the first place. I, I'm not, I, don't think we should, I don't think we should bank it on what they say. I, I think we need to be dealing with what we believe based on the facts. And I, can, I come back to what have we established the four criteria, which is the land protection can't re make a reasonable return. Well, I, I, is there a differ differential settlement issue right now on the structure? Um, on the second floor part, yes. On the first floor part, there is a lower corner in one of the rear bedrooms. Uh, but other than that, the house is not sinking three feet in one direction or anything like that, no. Okay. Do you want to go through the questions? We have. We have. I mean, for us. Or sure. I mean, I, mean I, I guess what I'm, what I'm concerned about is, again, I like to give people their the chance to survive as opposed to just having it shut off and put the wait a year. But that being said, I don't see anything in here that's giving us any any hope <laughs> to even make the argument. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, I, I, I think you went at it from a different approach than normal. I think you went at it from the point that you don't even need to be here. And consequently, it's skewed that way. And, and I have no problem with you wanting to go back and, and regroup. I can but, take it back and give you more information on the structure if you want. Um, Okay. Your, your call. If you want a table, I'm more than willing to let a few tables. But I would like to footnote one last thing before I leave. If we have to raise the existing building and put it up on pilings, we have to come before the board. That require that, that, Mr. Chairman? Sure. That's incorrect. If, you, right. can, you can elevate for floodplain or sand dune requirements without a variance. We, we made that change, yes. that amendment yes, in that's, our ordinance. That's in there. Yeah. But what I'm talking about is the building itself. It won't meet the character ordinance of the town. doesn't matter. doesn't have to. You we can go ahead and elevate it. Yeah, the, the character ordinance isn't designed to be used as a weapon against well, the wait town. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If, if he, can, he can, can put the new structure on filings, it's basically what he wants to do. Right. With, with the, the point that he's and trying to the make. Way, the house right next door, that's what happened to it about three or four years ago. And I'd really like to know how that got happened or that happened, and he can't get his. Okay. Let's, um, we, can't, we can't deal with that tonight, Ed, but tonight. I'd be happy to come back with a report on whatever house it is you're talking about. I have no idea. All I wanted to say is that Wald is making the case or trying to make the case that although he incorrectly assumed he couldn't elevate it, he can elevate it, but he's also saying the structure can't be elevated and sit on pilings in its current form. I just want to clarify all that. But it does not require a variance to elevate for floodplain or sand dune uh, reasons. If you want to get your flood insurance lowered and you want to elevate your structure, you can do that and you don't need a variance to do it. In the same location, you can go ahead and elevate it. That never used to be the well, case. Elevate and rebuild or just elevate? Just elevate. Just right. elevate. They can remodel. And that, and that's yeah, that's you can remodel. You can fix it. You can, right. you can change the flooring system or the framing system, rather, to, you know, if, if it's possible to do so. You can do all of that. For flood, because it's all required in order to get it elevated for floodplain reasons. Right. That and can happen. And that's what I mentioned in my write-up. We could do that. I'm not saying you have to come to variance just to elevate. But if we did elevate, we'd have to move the cottage off the lot, bring it back on after the structure of the, of the flooring was done, set the house on top of there, and then we'd have to renovate that house according to the ordinance, which is allowed to do by 30% volume and size, which is what we're proposing, but it would cost a huge amount of money to do that to get to the same down point if we get the variance to put the house up new in the first place, instead of putting it there and tearing it all apart and rebuilding it once we elevate it. The challenge is, and I need to end it here, the challenge is that we haven't established the need specific to the specific house that says that it's not viable. 
necessarily go any further than that until we've established that as a complete waste of the board's time. Because we, we're not there. So if we can't get past number one, or A, in the, the four criteria, we need to stop. Because we haven't established that. Nothing here has said anything about the property. And I get that people want to do that. And I get they're trying to use the, the, the guidelines in my opinion, I'm going to be blunt and probably a little bit harsh, but as a weapon against the town, but the ordinance isn't designed to be used against the town. The ordinance is designed to help the community develop. If it fits, it's, but you can't use it as a, as a, as a weapon to say, I want this because that's what the ordinance says. It's, it's backwards. They're saying, if you're going to build something, we want you to be as, as close to these requirements as possible. But you can't spin it and say, well, you, you're making us do this, and so we want it the way I, I want it now. It, it, that doesn't meet the criteria of the four, of the variance appeal. Well, well, let me if, it was, if it was just a regular home that didn't require variance appeal, go, hey, go, go at it, no problem. But let, me, let me back up a section here. If you took that existing house right where it is, it's allowed to be expanded 30% in square footage and volume. That's questionable. Okay. That house would end up looking just like we're talking about, except sitting on its concrete block foundation. Right. But we can't do that because we're in the erosion hazard zone, which requires the pilings to be under any renovation of a house. That's required. So we can't just take the house where it is and redo it. But there's no trigger to allow for the variance appeal. We haven't hit the trigger, which is the we haven't. What they want is not what is allowed in the It just doesn't work that way. So here's my advice. I would table it and try and regroup it and come back if, if I, that would be my suggestion. Or we can vote. I'll probably ask to do that, but I'm... I'm if right I'm, now, it's either we're going to vote on it or do it. Table. But I can ask to be tabled, but I'd like to have some guidance to what you're looking for because I have conflicts and ordinances that say you can do this and can't do this. Um, I think we're going to do the best we can to give you advice. Uh, again, if it doesn't meet the threshold, we can't give advice to something that doesn't need it. I don't know. But I don't have any information that says that it meets it at this point. So I'm going to move to table this for further information for two months. It can come up within the next two months. And then after that, it would drop off. Second. Discussion on the motion? Actually, table's not discussion. All in favor? That's uh, one and the unanimous. So uh, it, it gives, it, you get a room to breathe on it, but um, I think you've got to make the argument. And I think, the, again, I think you're saying it need, you need the more proof as to hardship. Is that true, Mr. There's no Chair? hardship. No, I've, I've okay. heard. There's no hardship. Yeah. Who made the motion? I did. Who second? I did. Uh, Leroy. Leroy. Okay, next appeal, and I think I think we have to go to one more appeal. I can appreciate if you have to leave. I think we owe the people that we bumped to be heard tonight. I'm not sure we're going to get to anybody else. Uh, but pardon? That I am here for that appeal. I'm not leaving. Okay. You're going to go against the 10:30 thing. I think we owe the, I think we owe that if the board agrees, uh, Mr. Chairman. If I may, if you recall, this one we had already really gone through everything, and it was only the character issue, and I think that's what. Uh, Ms. St. Clair wants to speak to tonight, and it really should be fairly quick if she can address that one thing, because you went through all um, all of the other criteria already. Mr. Mr. Chair, can we be candid and explain what that means to the other yeah, applicants yeah. that are here behind us? Uh, the, the, we want, we're, this will be the last one we hear tonight, but we won't be able to go any further than this. So if anybody's waiting for another one, it won't happen. You're welcome to stay if, if you know, we don't have popcorn or anything. but. Uh, we, we apologize that we weren't able to see you. Uh, the, the, you'll be, you'll be the first on the next. That's correct. You'll be the first on the next meeting. Agenda. Yes. And you don't have to do anything uh, other than just show up. But, and you'll be the first ones. It'll just go in the continuing order that it is. Okay. Again, I apologize. Uh, at, uh, and like Ms. Dong that said, if you can address the specific issue at hand rather than going through everything. So that, that would mean uh, nine white sands is the first next yes. next meeting. So we go, uh, mm. yeah, we go nine white sands. Then it would be um, 
six pearl and 39 ocean and then whatever comes after that somebody else comes on but you'll be in the next row and again i apologize for not being able to, to do better than that thank you thank you Paul. good evening good evening okay this is appeal number uh, 2607 it's a variance appeal that was brought back to us uh patricia crawford uh trustee for the patricia elaine crawford Re revocable trust 11 11th street uh, this is Matthew 23, parcel 73. And I'll introduce yourself and what we're trying to wrap up on that one. And Thank before you. I do that, I need to establish that the board is okay with the beginning. We haven't taken a vote on that. Is the board okay with this? Right, that we are okay with continuing past 1030. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay. All in favor? Okay, opposed? One opposed. Okay. So go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair with St. Clair Associates. Here tonight on behalf of the Patricia Crawford Revo Revo Revocable Trust. Wait, sorry. <laughs> and we were here before you folks back in July. And at our request, uh, this application was tabled. During that process, we went through the uh, four criteria for the hardship. And the one that the board members asked us to provide additional information on is actually criterion number three, and that is the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. We've provided some additional information for you folks, and I just wanted to go over a couple of things before we kind of get into that. You should have received today two letters from Butters uh, with regard to the project. The applicant uh, had spoken to their neighbors. I presented them the plan. Hard I do have a hard copy. I can read them if you like. They're very short. If you'd like to read them in, then we can just take them afterwards. That'd be great. Right in this package. They're in this package? I will. Nope, she's ahead of her curve, so uh, she's already put it in there for us. You've got them? This should be Yeah, I can just read them. We'll read them in at the appropriate time. But if you want to read them in, you're welcome to also. Okay, that's fine. Um, the first one that I have is uh, signed by uh, Peter Gross and Steve Gross, who are trustees. They are actually on 5 11th Street. So if you, Brian, if you go to the, I think it's the next, that one right there. Um, 5 11th Street is actually the house that is behind uh, this home. It's the yellow one. Brian has the cursor on it. So uh, the head of this is addressed to the same as addressed to Brian regarding the variance application, additional information on 11 11th Street regarding Patricia E. Crawford. And it says, Dear Brian, no objections to the attached proposed design of 1111 Street, Scarborough, Maine. And that's signed by Peter Gross and Steve Gross, trustees. The next letter uh, is addressed to Brian as well. This is from the owner of 1211 Street. They're actually located on the opposite side of 11th Street. Uh, the building was sort of the reddish roof on the other side. And it says, Dear Brian, no objections to the attached proposed design of 1111 Street, Scarborough, Maine, as presented in architect's uh, pictures. And this is signed by Paula A. Allen, 1211 Street, Scarborough, July 27, 2017. So those two letters should have been received by you folks. Uh, those were uh, letters that were provided by the applicant uh, as a result of their conversations with their neighbors. Uh, Kevin Bishop, who is uh, Ms. Crawford's brother, actually prepared these photos, and I'm just going to go through them quickly because one of the items that we, you know, talked about was the neighborhood. So we wanted to give you a little bit better visual uh, of the neighborhood. So the first slide that you have up here is um, what Brian refers to as the eagle view, uh, and this shows <coughs> the uh, double arrows are pointing to the actual cottage in question, and you can see. 11th Street uh, coming down from East Grand Avenue. It terminates uh, sort of midway between the two existing cottages, uh, 11th, 11th Street, and then across the street, that sort of reddish one, that's the 12 11th Street, uh, one that I just read the letter from. So from an aerial perspective, you can sort of see one of the criteria is with regard to density. As we had noted in our prior discussions, we are not changing the building footprint. Uh, it will remain the same and the home will remain in the same location on the lot. So from a density standpoint, we're not making any changes 
uh, with regard to that, and you can get a little bit better feel for some of the other homes uh, in the neighborhood with this image. The next slide shows <coughs> a view from the ocean, and this is looking sort of northwesterly. Uh, the ocean would be to your back. The cottage is sort of in the middle of the picture. The brown building uh, to the left of the cottage uh, is the abutting property to the west, and the building with the yellow building with the reddish roof is uh, the abutting building to uh, the east, and that is 12 11th Street. The next image shows just a close-up view. Uh, the applicant's home is on the right in this image. The uh, brown building that we just mentioned is the property that is, there's actually two houses on that property. That's at 96 East Grand is the address of that home. And in the background there, you can just sort of see a building that has a lot of windows. That's actually 511th Street. That was the other letter that the folks uh, submitted uh, with regard to that. So the next uh, slide <coughs> is looking easterly. The applicant's cottage is on the left. And again, 1211th Street is on the right <coughs> with the reddish roof in that. You can get to see sort of a view looking down uh, from some of the other homes that are on the other sort of parallel streets coming down towards the ocean. You get a little bit better feel for building heights, density, that type of thing. Uh, the next photo, <coughs> Kevin was uh, very brave and was on the roof of the porch when he took this photo. Uh, but it's a, a view looking up 11th Street. So if you look sort of to the diagonally to the left in the photo, that's the photo of 11th Street headed back towards East Grand Avenue. And the, the house that's primarily in this photo is 12 11th Street. And the roof that you see on the, on the left-hand side is the roof of the porch of the existing cottage. The next photo is looking up 11th Street. Uh, the house that is shown in that picture is actually on the corner of East Grand Avenue and 11th Street. Uh, the driveway for 5 11th Street is sort of mid-range uh, near where the gentleman is walking. In the, <coughs> the following photo is actually a close-up view of 5 11th Street. That's the house that's immediately behind. And as I mentioned, that's one of the folks that provided a letter of support uh, for uh, the project. <coughs> the next view is looking actually, they're actually on 511th Street looking back towards the ocean uh, and 1111th Street is primary in view. So this shows a close-up of the back view uh, of the cottage, uh, the porch on the back, the open porch on the left-hand side, and uh, the sort of wing, if you will, towards the west. <coughs> the next photo shows a little bit closer-up view of the two abutting houses to the west. Uh, again, that is um, 96 East Grand Avenue. That's that property there. Back to the rooftop view again. This is looking at those same uh, homes on that. Uh, and this is actually from the top of the roof on the west side of the cottage. The next photo is actually looking in a westerly direction. And it shows that brown building is actually the one that is adjacent to this lot. That's the 96 East Grand, and it just shows some of the additional homes along the ocean front uh, looking westerly on the site. And the next one is looking easterly, further easterly, so you get a little bit more of the surroundings uh, in that area. And you can see the, the different types of architecture that are, are throughout that uh, segment, if you will, and the number of stories of buildings uh, in that area. And again, this is just a further sort of close-up view of pretty much the same image. The last one is, are some of the new homes that have been recently built. These are actually on the other side, um, down by uh, King Street, but it does show a representation of what's more of the, the newer architecture uh, that is coming forward in the area. The next slide is, are actually the model re uh, representations of the building. When we were here before you folks last, one of the concerns was with regard to uh, the massing of the building, the size of it, uh, in comparison to some of the surrounding buildings, uh, as well as the, the change in the building from the existing uh,
caught its size. So I wanted to show you some updated plans. Uh, if you recall from the last presentation that we made, uh, these are quite a bit downsized, if you will, especially on the second and third story uh, with regard to that. So the next shot is just sort of a, a zoom around view. This is a view looking sort of <coughs> northerly uh, from the ocean. It would be sort of at your back. That uh, lower front corner is actually the existing sunroom uh, that is there, just new windows in that. Uh, the front on what would be sort of the, you know, the ocean, back to the ocean, past the little steps there, that's the open porch that would be closed in uh, on the first floor. If you remember from the photos, this is the, the westerly wing of the site. It's a bit wider uh, than it is now, but it's, it's still that same westerly wing. Uh, as I noted, we're not changing the footprint of this building. It does need to stay where it is and the size that it is, but the second uh, and third stories are where some of those changes have occurred. So on to the next slide. This is sort of a back corner view, uh, looking what would be southeasterly of the site. Um, the back porch area is sort of that, that notch, if you will. Each one of those steps is, if you look at the plan here, you can see those are the steps that are located. The notches in the building right here are those notches that are up there. Right in there. <coughs> the next view is sort of a, a eagle's view, if you will, uh, looking at the proposed new uh, renovations to the building. Uh, there is an open second story deck uh, above the enclosed existing porch on the first floor. Uh, and to balance the building, they've actually added this uh, dormer on what would be the easterly side of the building. So uh, that's a renovation to the older plan where, if you recall, that was quite a bit larger uh, in the original, or the prior submittal, I should say. So the next view is basically the same orientation, just from the ground elevation uh, with regard to that. So uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, an existing building that is within its existing footprint. We're not proposing to move it. We are proposing to do some renovations to the size of the second and third floor. The first floor would remain the same. The porches, the open porches would be uh, filled in. So. Um, when we met with you folks last, criterion number three, as I mentioned, uh, is the criteria that uh, you folks had concern about. Those are the older elevations, I believe, Brian, yep. uh, that you're going through. <clears throat> so that was a comparison. That was what was presented to you folks last time. Uh, and as you can see, we've made quite a bit of change uh, to reduce the scale of that. Um, <clears throat> we do have some narrative information with regard to that item that I'd be happy to read to you folks if you wish, um, but it is contained in your application materials uh, as well. Sir? Yes, thank you. Pardon? I said yes, thank you. Okay. So we can keep this fairly narrow because we've gone through pretty much all the criteria and we really wanted to address, I think, some concerns about the style. Um, I think, Ms. Shoup, I think you both have, you two are the biggest proponents of changing it, right? I think, yeah. if I remember correctly. If you'd like to speak to what your thoughts are. Well, uh, specifically, um, what was the square footage of your proposal last month? It was about 31,000 square feet. I'm just wondering what the square footage of this design is. Um, I did a comparison of the existing building and the proposed plan that you have before you tell I'm not sure I have the exact numbers on a comparison between the two, but um, it's about 2,060 square feet on the first floor. That is the existing cottage plus the open porch. That doesn't change, so there's no net change there. On the second floor, um, the architect has measured the uh, floor uh, at 935 square feet as existing and we're proposing 1160, so that's a 224 square foot expansion of the second floor. The, um, the um, attic space did not have an area that would be at an eight foot height, uh, so that was not calculated, there was no area, um, and that area now is 429 square feet. So we're looking at um, approximately 
650 square feet total expansion of the building. I'm sorry. From last Go ahead, last no. month, what was the, the new design? What's the full square footage? 3,000? Do you have that number? I mean, I did rough math, but I am not a designer. I am not a construction. I don't even want to tell you what my math was. But, um, I mean, the rough math I did with square footage is the same from the prior design. So I want to make sure I'm understanding that correctly. It was about 3,400. 3,400. And now we're at? Uh, 2,900. It's, sorry, it was 30, it's, it, it was around approximately 3,400 last for the original design. And it's approximately 2,900 now? Yes. Are you sure? Did I miss one? Yeah, I, I think we guessed yeah. that. I, I think, think you're just, I think we're just bit. pulling things out of the air. I don't like that. I mean, I just added the math on the plan to this is it. So. I mean, my math could be wrong, but I got 3,371. For the old one or the new one? For the new, new one. Yeah. It's pretty much the same as the 3,400. I mean, while you guys are doing some math, I'll come out on the pictures. Um, I mean, I couldn't help but notice in some of the pictures that already this, this house is the highest ceiling or has the highest roof line in one of these pictures that I'm looking at. And I do not see any house that has any sort of third story living. I don't see any houses that have that sort of the dormers, the big, large, shooting dormers, I mean, that's still creating a very large third floor pleasant pleasant square. Again, in this part of the neighborhood, there is no third, uh, there are no houses. Right. It's all two story. It's all two story, and the house behind it is one story. Um, you know, their view is going to change. And I understand we got letters from neighbors, but, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pulling from my training here, but my understanding was part of the decisions that we have to make is that the owners might not be the same in a year, and that, you know, they might sell their house in a year and we need to think about who's going to be living there in five years and how the people who don't receive notice are going to feel about a house this large going in is more than double what's there. It's all about the consistency with the character of the neighborhood. I agree. And I mean, I know you showed that great neighborhood that they built at the end of um, Pine no Point Road there, but that's pretty far away. And um, I know people who there a long time aren't crazy about it. Um, what worries me about putting in a house this big is that it's kind of setting a new norm of what that neighborhood is, where now suddenly everyone is going to want to be building these really large houses um, where they just aren't there right now. If I could just speak to the letters, um, I believe one of the folks on the board had recommended that we do solicit. That was me. Okay. <laughs> it was. And you know what, to be honest, I went back into my training manual stuff like that and kind of said, you know, and I mean, I think a question, you know, is from a letter from a trust, you know, do they live there full time or is they someone who just rents the property and, you know, putting a great big mansion might improve the, the value of their property, but if someone was living there year round, you know, they might not feel so happy about having a large, you know, over 1,000 square foot house there. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, there is. In line with the requirements of the, the ordinance, so if it uh, comes down to being, I think number three is the issue that, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, I find that if somebody can get it before I do, please feel free. Granting, oh, granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. Thank you. The, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality, <coughs> and I think that's a. I, my personal opinion is it's, it does. And I appreciate and I appreciate the work that's been done to 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 you know meet our uh, um, our guidance based on the last meeting, but I don't think there have really has been enough. Again, as Ms. Shu pointed out, you know, this is a third-story home where there are two-story and single-story homes everywhere else. Well, and I mean, I feel like the board recommended that the house is just too big, and I just feel like this is really not that much different. I understand the design is different, but the size is ultimately not that different. And again, you, you provided a chart at the last meeting of house, surrounding houses, which were, you know, the biggest one was just over 2,000 square foot. And I mean, they didn't have a third floor. What is the actual, have we determined what the actual square footage of this property is at this point? The proposed? Or is it still me? You want to give the numbers there? 
uh, Jeff McKenzie with his Bear Brothers. Um, the proposed square footage is 3,271 square feet. The existing square footage allowed right now is 2,995.27, which 1,500 of that is only finished. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, could you walk me through that again? You're talking about the existing structure? The existing as structure as it sits today is because you're allowed to finish the enclosed porches. It comes out to 2,000. 995 square feet, 0.27. But that's what's existing right. today. You're saying under, under air, air or under heat. You're saying that realistically, you're talking about not not decks, but porches. Talking about rooms and covered decks. Okay. That's uh, without adding anything else onto this. What's the covered deck definition? I guess I'm, I'm trying to I, I'm trying to get a handle on what you're talking about, and I don't disagree necessarily. All right, so you're saying that deck. All right, and when you're comparing that to the other property, the feet, the new design, are you taking into consideration that that second floor is also square footage? You're giving the same credit to that square footage on that one. In other words, we just have to be consistent. All that deck that's covered over here is that calculated into your equation? Because that would put, if the first floor is 2,000, then the second floor has got to be 4,000, right? Doubling up, and then you got a third floor. The existing first floor right now is 1,499.382 square feet living. Okay. And you can add 560.29 square feet of covered porch which comes up to 2,059.62. The second floor is a total of 935.6458 square feet. The third floor isn't even counted because it's only six feet high. It's attic space. That's the current? That's existing. Okay. And that comes out to 2,995.27 square feet. That's what's there right now. But what we need to look at is what is the living space right now, not what's the deck and what's the attic. We need to look at what the living space is. What's the living space right now would be the 1499 plus the 935. If you just take the 560 out. Okay, so it's about 2500. 2500. But we're looking but at the way you get to look at it, the way the way the code is, and the way it's allowed, I we could have come in and get a permit from Brian just to close it, and then come to the board. So it's allowed. It's it's living space. It's it's calculated space. That's how the code is written. But it's not living space right now. It is I living space. I understand that you can you can enclose it and make it living, <laughs> space, but it's not living space right now. Well, they're talking about the existing structure. Right. Not altering it. So I get all that. I guess the question comes down to being, and it really, I'm going to put it where, where you two had a legitimate concern you wanted to address. What, I come back to what was last month's square footage versus this It sounds like they're the exact same square footage or within 100 feet. Not the existing versus the new, but. Do you have the plan for the last? I don't have that information for you. Okay, that's fair. I mean, that's fair. I think it's honest, so we can deal with honest. <laughs> but at the same vein, I don't know how we can make. I think what I'm hearing from these two members is that it's it's not it's too big for your. Well, I feel they changed the design of the house, but the footage. I mean, the size of the house. But I also think your your point, the question around character, right? Looking at the photos that were presented, they're all two-story and very low-pitched roofs. So the elevation of the peak on the buildings that are there, in my opinion, are lower than what you're proposing. Because if you look at the pitch on your roof and you have a third floor that is in, it, that is habitable, I think it's going to 
character-wise, it's going to change. I agree with that statement because this is truly a three-story home versus the other homes, which are two stories, and they look like they're two stories because of the pitch on the roof. So I think your photos kind of hurt you in that case because it does, in my opinion, change the character of the neighborhood. Um, to read on that would be <coughs> we've got to put code compliance staircases in, okay, which aren't there now. Those will take up 156.55 square feet each. The second staircase will do the same. So this 300 square feet right there, taken up for additional size that we need to make code compliance. But I'm not talking about the square footage at all. Oh, we're talking existing to proposed at this point. You take the 300 square feet out, you're back at 29.95. Again, you're talking square footage. I'm not talking square footage. I'm talking the mass of the building, the height of the building. The height of the building yes. presentation is increasing four feet, right? The third floor, which is 490 square feet, which we don't have a third floor in there right now, mm -hmm. it's only six feet high, that's based at eight feet. That's where our mechanics got to go because we can't put them under the porch, under the building anymore. Uh, again. I hear what you're saying. What I'm saying is the mass of the building, which is the, the sail, as if it were a sail like a, a boat, the size of that building and the height is going to make the character of that area change. In my opinion, I'm only one vote. I know you've got issues with, me with mechanics. I know you've got issues with stairwells. I get it. But that doesn't change when this building goes up it's going to change the character of the neighborhood. Right, and I feel like, again, you know, we gave you the opportunity to come back and kind of present evidence regarding the stairs and stuff like that. This is the first time I've heard about the stairs. I'm not, I apologize if it's in here, but um, again. Yeah, Mr. Chair, what I'm looking at is the last month's information that was given. The, the largest property that they referenced was 2438 for living area. 2438. So we're looking at a 3400, 3372 or whatever for this, as opposed to the largest one being 2438. We're almost 1,000 feet long. I, I think you're hearing the, the, the tone. I do, and I just wanted to clarify something on that. That chart is based on uh, information on the assessor's database, and I know in going back and looking at that chart in the comparison for this building, we noted that the square footage that was shown on that chart really is the first floor <laughs> and didn't take into account the second floor of the building. So not sure, never been in the other homes, but there may be a situation where those numbers may be a little bit different uh, with regard to that. I certainly do respect your comments with regard to the building architecture. And I personally love the design. I, I do. I mean, I personally like it. But I'm number one, one person, and you get four that kind of feel differently. And no, I like it. I like the design. So the two of us uh, that like the design. I do think it's inconsistent with the goals, which is, so I, I support my fellow board members on that, because even though I might like the design, it's got nothing to do with what should or should not be approved. I mean, it's a very appealing design. I don't, I don't know how anybody could not like it. But that being said, it isn't consistent with the character of that neighborhood. And it's, I think, uh, I go back, I would go back I'd to like the I'd like to make board. a statement Feel about, free. about the character. <clears throat> I think if you take a look at the character of the neighborhood from year to year to year, it's always changing. And it's, the homes are going to get larger and larger and larger. And if we don't start allowing that, we're not doing a favor to anybody. But, I don't but it doesn't change the question that we have to answer. It comes back to what the requirements are. What? We have to meet, we have to meet the requirements. We can, we can answer the question any way we want. True. You know? The character doesn't have to be exactly the same all the time. 
No, but I feel like, you know, we're representing our neighbors and the people of our town. And, I, you know, I think about people who maybe aren't abutters, but, again, live in that neighborhood. Are they going to be happy about this? Are they going to appeal this to the Superior Court? Right. If they are aware that this, you know, 3,200 square foot house is going in and, you know, obstructing their view, we're going to be in our own mind. And I can't, I can't argue Mr. Blaze's point, but the court doesn't look upon us and say, you know, they really like the design. So they let it go through. We're here to answer the questions as, opposed, as presented to us, and it's those four questions. So until they change the questions, I have to pass the straight face test, and if it goes to court, then it needs to be in our favor because that's what we're here for. We're not here to represent the family that wants to put the home up. We're here to represent the town. And the question is, does it change the character? And I believe it does. So I think we have two options at this point. We either um, uh, allow you to table it once more or uh, we proceed forward and vote on it because there is definitely a mix of opinions here and it may pass, it may not. Sure. Um, so those are two options. Well, just a couple of things that I have to say before we do that is, one, we can't be the ones to change the character of the neighborhood. We can't just say, oh, well, that looks good and we're just going to ignore that question. We can't do that. And I would have liked to have seen something that showed a little bit more <coughs> regard for what we were looking for. I think we come in and we're under 100 feet or under 50 feet. That's not really showing a lot of regard of what we're looking for. We were looking for something probably more in that 28, 2700 square foot range that put it in with most of these other properties. And I just don't see that that happened. It, it's pretty much the same as it was. It's pretty design, but it's pretty much the same as it was. There wasn't really much taken into account from our comments. My advice is use table. Well, let me, let me see. Yes. My name is Kevin Bishop. I'm the brother of uh, the applicant. Um, when we were here last, you didn't like the third floor. So the architect changed it, changed the design to, to two and a half. So this is a two and a half story house. It's, it's, there's a two and a half story house there now, and it's always been the biggest house in the neighborhood. It was the first house in the neighborhood, 1890. And, and I suppose based on that argument, you could build it just the same size and no one would have a problem here. Well, we could take, we could. But we could. I guess, sir, the, what we're dealing with is not what you're talking about. What I'm suggesting, and we'll take a vote right now and I'll guarantee you it'll fail and you'll have to wait a year. My advice is that you table and move it and come back and give the board the respect that we, we deserve. I feel like we've already given them the opportunity to come back. Um, I'm, I'm not a believer in penal penalizing people. I don't think it's healthy. It's a small town. I don't think there's a reason to do that. I think we work well together as a board, and I think we need to work with the, with the community. But that being said, I don't have a problem with saying this doesn't work. And there's four people on this board that are immediately saying that. I'm questionable, and you've got one person saying yes. That's not good numbers. And I would say take into account what we're trying to tell you. Don't come back to us with a 3,200 or 3,350 square foot building. Look to see what you can come up with that's going to be livable for you. You're already the biggest house. Get it somewhere as close to where it is now. My advice is also if talk to the, the code enforcement officers. They'll help you. And, and what may be a misconception on my part, and I might be visualizing it wrong, if you could overlay digitally on the photo of the existing home what the new building would look like maybe it doesn't look like a massive change that's a good point but based on what i'm seeing from the presentation it looks very big from those elevations compared to what i'm seeing on the photos so maybe if you overlaid you know just laid on top of that maybe we're wrong scale the building i could be all whacked and maybe it looks identical right give a comparison like a digital rendering showing the existing the proposed and as mr loisel said you know, the perception is everything. I mean, it's, again, I don't think anybody has a problem with design. It's just, I think the sale analogy is a very good analogy. So I'm going to move that we table. Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I, if I could just ask one question on that. Yeah. We will be seeking a tabling motion. We do appreciate that. Um, for clarity, the existing building numbers that had been discussed and are actually included in the assessor's database do not include the covered porch area. That area is roughly 500 square feet. We'd like to have the opportunity 
to include that as part of our program because it is very key to that. So just want to clarify that when we talk about expansion, that we do have the ability to include that as sort of a base number in that. So in quantifying you know, whatever the square footage is, we account for the fact that 500 square feet of that is actually already a covered porch, it's already on the site, it's just simply putting walls in that area. I think as one of the representatives from Risborough said, what was it, 29 something if you covered those and put those into living area? 29.95. I wouldn't have as much of a problem with that as I do 33. Very well. The, the other thing is I think you've you got to compare apples to apples. I mean, okay. you're going to have to do the same thing on the new project and count those stacks in the calculation which I'm sure they weren't calculated when we put these numbers we have. That being said, I don't think it's about the numbers. I think it's about presentation. And so I think the numbers are a gauge. They're, the, you know, they're a gauge, but I don't think the real issue is. The issue is does it fit with the community as it stands? And I think th that doesn't mean it has to be backwards. It doesn't have to be from the 1900s. And I think we can talk about bringing it up to a larger whatever the, the reasonable standard is, but it's not maximum benefit. It's not supposed to be maximum benefit. It's supposed to be reasonable. And that's what, this, that's what the relief is for, reasonable, not maximum. And I would argue that what we've seen is pretty close to maximum. So uh, I'm going to move to table. Second. Second. All in favor? Four opposed? One. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank so you very much. We'll get you in the next meeting. We'll just do a table for one of them. Where are they going to phone the next meeting? After it doesn't come back if we phone off. But I'm just saying, where well, we rearranged it around, <laughs> where are they going to be? Yeah, I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> we'll go right there. Who seconded the motion? Um, I did. Okay. Thank you, board, for indulging. What did you What did you say at the end? It's a table till next month. And it doesn't come back. It's off. You asked them if they wanted to come back next month or if they wanted to wait. Just, did you guys want, I'm assuming to you back. want to come back next month. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so long meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Board, thank you for, 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 thank you for working so hard at this meeting. This was a tough meeting for a variety of reasons. Um, anybody have anything that they want to add or discuss? I have a couple comments. Um, I think it's important that uh, as we're going through here to really watch the um, uh, I'm, I'm suffering from it right now but be concise and every time you say make a motion or I move to or as soon as the second you say I make a motion you're already in that that stage of we're making a motion this is what's going on the record so when you say make a motion I move to accept appeal number whatever whatever or for these three reasons, A, B, and C, keep them as concise as possible because that's what goes into the record as far as what a court would see later on. Um, I think we have a tendency to uh, sort of, we state the motion and then we go on for the long explanation that we just went through previously. That's already been discussed. And well, I'm certainly going through that today. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and, it's, uh, and it happens. And no, we, it's, we, we get excited and that it's, that's perfectly okay. I'm guilty of it myself. I'm just saying it as sort of a, and myself included, you know, let's be more uh, conscious of that. Uh, and be concise and be clear. That's all I got. And, and Brian, what do oh. Uh, what do you want us to do around the? Um, yeah, the package, do you guys yeah. norm when something's tabled? Do you keep them or? Do yeah, you I, I, I keep them, but they keep on putting them in the package. I put it back. So in the I package. do keep it. You put it back in your yeah. in your bag. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Put, put it back, in, back in your bag. Um, you want everything? I mean, yeah, just the ones that are left. Yeah, the one. Well, wow. Karen sorted out. Yeah, the ones that we okay. didn't get <laughs> <laughs> get to. You'll get them back. You'll get them back a couple weeks before that. Before the hearing, um, we're going to get new ones also. No, no. Oh, wow, you'll get the new any new information submitted. It gets hard to track it when things get tabled, but um. I just want to say, you know, I think it's hard when people come with like five representatives and you give them a second chance, and they, you know, they take up the whole meeting, and you know, yeah. with other people waiting, and they weren't able to see, and you know, they, you know, we gave them recommendations. Yeah. Representatives in front of us. Consistently, and so I just feel like you know, with regards to the other residents who are applying for applications here, like 
we gave them a chance, and I mean, especially on this last appeal, I feel like they did not take our recommendations at all. And so, I don't disagree. How I feel. Mm -hmm. And I know I can be a little harsh. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. My background? I Nothing like it. Either. Off from the zoning board type things, I'd just like to thank everybody that came out for the conference series <coughs> in the park this year. It was great attendance, and we really loved everybody being there, and I have a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs>